There will now be an opportunity for silent prayer or meditation. Please be seated. Order. The secretary will read the first order of the day. Consideration of the report of the joint Committee on Ethics and Members' Interests on alleged contravention of the Code of Ethical Conduct and Disclosure of Members' Interests by Honorable Mosebenzi Zizwane, MP. I'm informed that there is agreement that there will be no declarations taken. I now recognize the Honorable, the Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, to Honorable Members. I hereby move that the report be adopted as it is presented. Thank you very much. The motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? None, no objections agreed to. Honorable members, the charge of breaching the code of ethical conduct and disclosures of members' interest for assembly and permanent council members of which Honorable Zwane has been found guilty is a very serious one. The committee did not, however, recommend that reprimand be issued. There will be no reprimand. For the findings made by the committee, the assembly has agreed on the following penalties. That the member be fined the amount of five days salary for receiving benefits and hospitality that was not disclosed for the period 2015-16. That the member enter an apology in the house for the press statement that he issued that had to be cont contradicted by cabinet and for appointing special advisors who were business associates of, of the Guptas. That the member be suspended from parliamentary debates for one parliamentary term for their involvement in the sale of optimum coal mine to Tegeta. I note the order, honorable members. Order, order man, order. Now, honorable members, I note that honorable Zwane is not here this afternoon. However, I do want to inform the house that the penalties will be implemented and the house will be informed at the appropriate time. That concludes this item. Order. Honorable members, the next item on the order paper <clears throat> is a debate on an urgent matter of national public importance. Yes, Honorable Chief Whip. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Uh, on the previous uh, ruling that you have made, I just want to confirm 
that Honorable Zwane is aware of today's plenary. He was uh, duly informed by me to be present in the house today. So I, for records, I want to put that. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Chief Whip. Honorable members, honorable members, let us take note of the comments made by the chief whip, that the honorable members had been informed. Hi, what's happening? First danger. Honorable members, I said, leave man. I, I note the hand of honorable Singh. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, uh, firstly, I want to appreciate the comments made by the Chief Whip of the African National Congress, because we were going to rise on a point of order. It, it's normal practice that when a member is reprimanded or, or such a sentence is being passed on any member of this house, that member is either physically in the house or virtually. And we don't have any indication of that member being either virtually uh, in the house. So I would uh, like to recommend, Honorable Member, that we look at our rules to see whether or not, when the member is in the House, that he be reminded of that sentence. This is a very, very serious offence uh, that the country should really take note of. And thank you, Honorable Speaker, for giving us the sentence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Singh. Honorable Members, we now proceed. The next item on the order paper is a debate on an urgent matter of national public importance in terms of Rule 130 in the name of Dr. D. T. George on the economic impact of the Financial Action Task Force Grey listing of South Africa and steps required to exit the Grey list. I now recognize the Honorable D. T. George. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. On February 24th, the Financial Action Task Force FATF added South Africa to its gray list of countries that are under increased monitoring to address strategic deficiencies in countering money laundering, terrorist financing, and proliferation financing. Our gray listing was no surprise. In 2019, FATF red flagged South Africa for high levels of corruption and non-compliance to regulations. Although National Treasury scrambled to improve laws and regulations, it was too late. There was no coordination between the financial and the security clusters, and currently South Africa remains deficient on security. By 2025, we must improve on investigations, increase prosecutions, identify, seize, and confiscate proceeds of these crimes, and implement targeted financial sanctions. Despite the, mar that, despite the market already factoring in the likely gray listing before it was officially announced, thus dampening the immediate impact, The Economist reported on the 4th of March that the listing makes it more expensive for South African banks and companies to do business abroad. The response from Treasury was that the impact would be minimal and that, and then the minister subsequently declared that we would exit the gray list by mid-2024. The minister needs to explain exactly how this will be achieved. No matter how many laws are enacted, we will not exit the gray list when there is no political will to uphold the rule of law. Over 1 billion rand per month is stolen from ESCOM, yet the minister agreed to hide irregular and fruitless and wasteful expenditure from auditors in the hope of obtaining a better audit outcome. That doesn't make any sense unless it is designed to cover up the involvement of senior ANC politicians in the theft at ESCOM. Grey listing is correlated with a decline in market capitalization, increased supplier cost, reduced firm profitability, reduced national income and expenditure, and reduced access to capital. If South Africa does not exit the gray list quickly, we can expect increasing reluctance from the international financial markets to do business with South Africa. With 12 million South Africans unable to find work, we need to grow our economy. Kenya and Zambia have overtaken South Africa as more viable investment destinations because they are better governed. Gray listing is a reflection of our diminishing status in the world. FATF is an intergovernmental organization founded on the initiative of the International Group of Seven, the G7, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, United Kingdom, and United States. President Ramaphosa, who hides dollars in his furniture, was not invited to the G7 summit in Japan next month, despite previously being invited every year since he became president. 
South Africa is being frozen out because our government is making the wrong policy choices. On the same day that South Africa was grey listed, FATF suspended the membership of the Russian Federation. Although South Africa claims to be neutral in Russia's war on Ukraine, it has demonstrated its active support for Russia by participating in war games with Russia and China, permitting Russian ships to dock at our ports and military bases where, under the cover of darkness, they supply Russia. Helping Russians evade international sanctions will not speed up our exit from the grey list. The debate on the future of AGOA, the act that provides South Africa with duty-free access to the US markets for over 1,800 products has begun. This is up for renewal in 2025, and government has placed this in jeopardy. A congressional delegation postponed its planned visit to South Africa from August to November because they did not consider it to be proper for them to be in South Africa at the same time as Vladimir Putin, the Russian war criminal that the current South African government invited to the BRICS summit. He should be arrested and not celebrated. The DA's position on AGOA that we made crystal clear during our recent engagements in the USA is that despite government's unacceptable behavior, AGOA should be renewed and that we need to look beyond AGOA at a permanent trade solution that will improve trade, grow South African business, and unlock the poverty trap imposed by a failing government. Our view is that not re renewing AGOA will be a form of sanctions and that it must always be clear who gets hurt the most when sanctions are imposed. It won't be the corruption riddled government that will suffer, but rather the millions of South Africans who already face the reality of food insecurity and starvation in the face of a government induced cost of living crisis that has wiped the food off the tables of millions of households. 30 years after our first democratic elections, South Africa is teetering on the brink of collapse. Incoherent economic policy that placed the corrupt and dysfunctional state at the center of our economy introduced unproductive rent seeking through a black economic empowerment model that only enriched the political elite, cater deployment that hollowed out the public sector and state owned enterprises that are fronts for theft of the people's money. We've also been clear that the ANC is not to be confused with South Africa. The ANC, distinct from South Africa, does not speak for the majority of South Africans in its support for Russia in its war and in its drift from our values of democracy, freedom, and the rule of law as enshrined in our constitution. By choosing Russia and China, the ANC has chosen to side with authoritarian regimes and is no longer a shining beacon of hope for the victory of human rights over oppression. Government has failed domestically and is now failing internationally. The DA will disrupt this trajectory. The days of one party dominant rule are over and we're now heading towards a post ANC, multi-party coalition national government that will focus on facilitating a better life for everyone who lives in South Africa. Thank you, Speaker. The next speaker is the Honorable Mabiletsa. Thank you, House Chair, Chief Whip, Honorable Members. The ANC welcomed this debate of national importance. At this, it will provide the opportunity for the ANC to clarify what is so historically we have done, where the shortfalls are and what has been done to correct these shortfalls all within the required regulatory international standards. We welcome this debate because it also provides the opportunity to bank what the sponsor of this debate is trying to do, mislead the house into believing that we are about to suffer a serious decline in GDP between 1% and 3% as a result of being grey-listed. My comrade Matafa will deal more with this. Historically, it was the ANC in parliament who has actually led the work of oversight on anti-money laundering, anti-money laundering laws and counter-terrorism financing. The ANC drove the initiative with other parties then joining in with which we welcome. In 2015, the Standing Committee of Finance at the insistence of the ANC began a process of financial sector transformation. In this process, we began to realize the totality and miscontentness of the financial sector, the largest sector in our economy, to the dangers of financial corruption, money laundering, and terrorism financing. This we discovered alongside the corrupt practices of illicit financial flows and illegal base erosion and profit shifting. So, whilst these matters may be distinctly different, 
they all prey upon the financial sector as a host, a mechanism through which financial sector criminal criminality is generated and transmitted. The work of the Standing Committee of Finance at that stage brought in the Financial Intelligence Center and then specialized units in SARS and the National Treasury. It was at that stage that we engaged with the work of the Financial Action Tax Force. But because we were dealing with financial sector transformation, that remained the focus. We acknowledged at that time, 2015 to 2017, that far more oversight needed to be done on anti-money laundering, anti-money laundering laws and counter-terrorism financing. Sadly, the important recommendations from the Standing Committee on Finance was captured in the legacy report of the Fifth Parliament have not made progress in the financial sector and NEDLEG where they were referred to. And this should concern Parliament. Like all recommendations that are not followed through later, there are consequences. Those consequences were to be dealt in 2019 when the Financial Action Tax Force, which uses peer reviews to assess compliance of internationally agreed standards by member countries, conducted its review. When the result came out in 2021, we had as a country done poorly, in particular the law enforcement agencies. No country amongst the 40 members of the Financial Action Tax Force is fully compliant with all 40 tax force recommendations and all 11 effective immediate outcomes. South Africa was deemed to have too many weaknesses in its legal framework and put under a one year observation period in October 2021 to October 2022, giving country time to address the 67 recommended actions. 2022 was the year of action to respond to the review. Although if you listen to the sponsor of this debate, you may think nothing has been done. Government and parliament together have moved rapidly in a very short space of time. Contrary to the sponsor of the sponsor to this debate is claiming, government, parliament and presidency have worked together to ensure that. On the 22nd December, 2022, the general laws anti-money laundering and combating terrorism financing amendment act and programmed and commenced its work after being signed by the president. The act amended five pieces of legislation, including the Companies Act, the Financial Intelligence Center Act, the Financial Sector Regulation Act, the Non-Profit Organization Act, and the Trust Property Control Act. That on the 23rd December 2022, the protection and constitutional democracy against terrorist and related activities amended act commenced after being signed by the president. This act expands the, defi the definition of terrorist activities, provides for crime related to, ter to terrorist training, the joining of terrorist organization and the person possession and distribution of publication with terrorism related content. That in February, 2023, South Africa made a high level political commitment to work with the Financial Action Tax Force and the Eastern and Southern Africa Anti-Money Laundering Group to strengthen the effectiveness of its anti-money laundering and countering the financial of terrorism regime. Since the adoption of the Mutual Evaluation Report in June 2021, South Africa has made significant progress on many of the recommended action to improve its system, including by developing its own anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism policies to address higher risk and duly amending the legal framework for anti-terrorism financing. Contrary to, them, to how the sponsor of this debate is trying to mislead the National Assembly, the Financial Action Tax Force then placing South Africa on the gray list for increased monitoring, which is the lesser punitive list to the, to the other list of high risk jurisdiction subject to a call for action, which does not apply to South Africa, the Financial Action Tax Force in its statement on 23rd February 2021 has 
This to say about South Africa, jurisdiction under increased monitoring are actively working with the FATF to address strategic deficiency in their regimes to counter money laundering, terrorist financing, and proliferation financing. When the FATF places the jurisdiction under increased monitoring, it means the country has committed to resolve swiftly the identify strategic deficiencies within agreed time frames and is subjected to increased monitoring. This is a very diff uh, different picture to what the sponsor of this debate is trying to generate and distribute in, in this debate. In fact, the sponsor of the debate needs to get in step with the Financial Action Tax Force on how we work together to address deficiencies in the interest of our country and all member states, instead of trying to use this as an opportunity to draw attention to himself in a superstitious manner and his moonshot party. What needs to be acknowledged is that to deal comprehensively with the technical deficiencies which required legislative amendments and development, a working group was established comprising of 12 departments and state entities to comprehensively deal with what the tax force had raised. In, it is the work of, of that working group that has resulted in the General Laws Amendment Act. It is this work that the sponsor of this debate does not have the integrity to acknowledge. So what did the Financial Action Tax Force say in January 20, 2023 in its assessment of ACE progress? It found that South Africa had made significant and positive progress in reducing the 67 recommended action to eight strategic deficiencies where more progress is required. As a result, South Africa was greatly stated while these are addressed, even as the tax force recognized the significant and positive prog progress made since 2019. We have two years to rectify the eight strategic deficiencies. These deficiencies are complex and the work of the 12 state departments and entities require parliament support and oversight as they work to remedy the shortcomings. In particular, in particular critically dealing with outbound mutual legal assistance requests that, that help facilitate money laundering, terrorism financing is a priority improving risk-based supervision and designated non-financial business and professions is, is another priority and ensuring that competent authorities have timely access to accurate and up-to-date beneficial ownership information on legal persons and arrangement is a priority. In conclusion, far from the detached view of the sponsor of this debate, Dedicated and focused work is being carried out to deal with legislative and capability gaps of defeating and seizing. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Serupin. Thank you very much, House Chair. House Chair, on the 23rd of April, 2023, the Sunday Times published an article with the headline, How Millions in Terror Funding Flowed Through South Africa. On 11 November 2022, the Citizen ran a newspaper article with the headline, Why South Africa Provides Fertile Ground for Terrorism Funders. On the 8th of November 2022, the Mail and Guardian ran an article with the headline, US Sanctions for People Linked to Alleged ISIS Cell in Durban. On the 7th of October 2021, a headline reads, South Africa exposed to foreign terrorist financing risk, report reveals. And going all the way back to the 6th of August 2016, the Institute of Security Studies issued a brief with the headline, South Africa and Terrorism, the links are real. I could go on with tens of dozens of similar headlines to provide the timeline here. But what I am trying to illustrate is simple. For many years, the government was warned in the public domain that there were issues with South Africa acting as a clearinghouse and financing source for terrorist financing. As far back as 2016, the problem was flagged and the government was in denial about a very harsh and troubling fact 
financiers of global terrorism had identified weaknesses in the South African financial system and were exploiting them for illicit purposes. In its 2016 brief, the Institute for Security Studies stated, and I quote, evidence suggests that South Africa has been used as a transit point for terrorists and as a base for planning, training, and financing terror operations. But perhaps the bigger problem is government communication in response to the allegations and mounting evidence. Rather than shedding light and inspiring confidence, the official line has fostered distrust and uncertainty. Fast forward to 25th April 2023, just a few days ago, the US Treasury Department identified 52 individuals and entities here in South Africa operating in vast international money laundering, sanctions evasions, and terrorist financing. And in November last year, the US sanctioned four persons based in Durban for providing financial support to the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. It is an indictment on our own law enforcement systems, agencies, and processes that these activities happening here in our own country had to be detected by a foreign power. It's embarrassing that our country is being used as a base for such activities, and that this goes on and on for years without action from local law enforcement. We have seen in the recent past issues such as fake passports in the hands of Al-Qaeda members and boxes of South African passports found in raids in other countries. We also know that from a Sunday Times report on 23rd April, that 400 million rand may have flowed to ISIS from South Africa and may have been used to fund terrorism in Uganda two years ago. And what we're seeing is a pattern, an incapable state overrun with corrupt elements exploited to support global terror activities and the incapable state is in denial about the problem. Despite sanctions against multiple individuals in South Africa for terrorist financing, there have been no arrests of these persons to date. There have been no charges, just a commitment in words to do better. In March, 2022, South Africa's own financial intelligence center, as well as the FATF report in 2021, found that one of the key problems South Africa sits with is in our law enforcement because our agencies lack the skills and resources to investigate money laundering and terrorist financing. They're unable to detect the cash proceeds of crime and they're unable to obtain accurate information and proactive identification and investigation of money laundering networks and professional enablers. This is the toxic mess that the incapable state has created. And this has led to gray listing. If law enforcement does not step up, no amount of legislative reform will alleviate this situation. However, one wonders if it suits the corrupt elements in our government to have poor law enforcement and financial crimes, lest their own misdeeds come to light. It's therefore clear that the only way to escape gray listing, end terrorist financing, and get law enforcement working again is to have a change of government in order to build a capable state. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Paulson. Greetings to the President and Commander-in-Chief, President Julius Malema, the incoming President of South Africa, members of the Central Command Team, members of Parliament, fighters and people of South Africa. House Chairperson, we will deal with the decision of the Financial Action Task Force to greylist South Africa and practical steps of what must happen. But first, allow us to give context to who the Financial Action Task Force is and why this background is important. The Financial Action Task Force was established in 1989, an informal grouping of former colonizers, the United Kingdom, the United States, Germany, France, Italy, and Japan with the inclusion of Canada. We must always remind each other that this grouping, also known as the G7, through institutions and platforms such as the IMF, the World Bank, the annual pilgrimage of the most sophisticated world financial criminals in Davos, and of course, the Financial Action Task Force. These institutions and gatherings are not meant to address world poverty, inequality, or hunger. They are also equally not interested in true human freedom because it is the oppression and the exploitation of the working class that supports the capital accumulation and social order, where the richest 1% owns and controls two thirds of all new wealth worth 42 trillion US dollars created since 2020, almost twice as much money as the bottom 99% of the world's population. 
More than 700 million people live in extreme poverty, meaning that they are likely to go to bed on an empty stomach without decent shelter and human dignity. In this day and age, we have millions of people living in modern slavery with forced labor and forced marriages. We give this background because it is important to demonstrate that we do not say what we are going to say without full knowledge of the geopolitical dynamics. These institutions are at times abused to deal with dissent from people who hold different ideological beliefs than the current capitalist order. Speaker, the FATF was created as a global money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog. South Africa has been a member of the Financial Action Task Force since 2003. The evaluation which led to grey listing was conducted by the IMF. We know who we are dealing with here. But now let's turn our focus to this debate. The decision to grail South Africa effectively means that the country has weak measures to combat illicit financial flows and the financing of terrorist activities. The grey listing of South Africa should not come as a surprise to anyone. And we do not need the IMF and its bodies to tell us that we are harboring financial criminals. The EFF, since its formation in 2013, has highlighted the high rate of illicit financial flows. We were the first political party to make submissions to the Davis Tax Committee on practical measures to deal with aggressive tax avoidance, profit shifting, base erosion, and illicit financial flows. We were the first political party to call for the introduction of legislation to criminalize aggressive tax avoidance, to give SARS more tools to fight illicit financial flows and aggressive tax avoidance. We were the first political party to call for the establishment of a joint task force that would include SARS, SAPS, and the FIC, the South African Reserve Bank, and any other law enforcement agency to coordinate the fight against illicit financial flows. But we are not shocked that there is no interest, believable and practical solutions to deal with illicit financial flows and financing of terrorism. The president of South Africa himself, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, stands accused of money laundering and tax evasion, and a substantial motion was brought to this parliament. The fact that the ANC uses its majority to protect him and undermine the democratic workings of parliament does not mean that there is no prima facie evidence the man must respond to. The president's dealings through his dodgy dealings as a sole director of Ntaba Union Estate, the company that owns Palapala, is an example of why South Africa was grey-listed today. We are not going to implement any of the recommendations successfully and stop illicit financial flows and the financing of terrorist activities when there is prima facie evidence that even the sitting head of state is a possible culprit of these crimes. Only the EFF government will deal decisively with illicit financial flows after we take power in 2024. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Order, honorable members. The next speaker is the Honorable Nkosi Butelezi. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. We'll be lying if we say that we know what will happen to our country when it comes to the subject matter we're order, discussing today. Order, honorable members, order. We knew very well, but we gave ourselves false hope that we might avoid to be gray listed. Indeed, Chair, this matter we're debating today is urgent and of national importance. South Africans deserve to know what is this gray listing means and what led us into it and what we have to do to get ourselves out of it. I'm not going to talk about the technical details that confuse many people as the ANC has done, but I'll be very simple and practical. This is the judgment chair against South Africa because the ANC-led government lacks political will to achieve the sufficient progress to address issues raised by FATF. Simply put, the ANC-led government has failed to deal decisively with corruption because they themselves are corrupt. The ANC-led government has failed to combat money laundering which they are deeply involved in, that the ANC-led government has failed to implement measures to counter the financing of terrorism. Therefore, this means that all of the failures of the ANC and lack of political will from the, from the ANC will make it difficult for our country to attract both local and foreign investors. This means that it will be difficult to get financial assistance if need arises. Even if we get the assistance, it will come at a much higher rate because the ANC has put our country at a very high risk. 
Unfortunately, Honorable Chair, all of this will put pressure on our ailing in the economy and will cause it to shrink. Whereas people of South Africa will suffer more, and this is the last thing that we can afford as a country. So how do we get out of this predicament we find ourselves in as a result of the ANC-led government? We must do the following, Honorable Chairperson. We must remove the ANC from power. We must confront the enemy of the people of Goodwill, which is the ANC. We must take revenge on these unscrupulous leaders who serve nothing but their own interest. We must take revenge on the enemies of our country's progress, people who have shown us beyond doubt that they are not working for us, but against us. Honorable Chair, it doesn't matter how good and effective our laws are to address matters raised by FATA, to deal with corruption, money laundering, crime, and financing terrorism. But the truth is that as long as we have the ANC at the helm, all these measures are useless. Recently, the same hypocrites opposed the legis legitimate parliamentary process aimed at dealing decisively with corruption and money theft in ESCOM. Why? Because they were protecting their own comrades. Just recently, on the person, the same ANC used its majority to defeat yet another parliamentary process to hold the president to account on Palapala matter. Therefore, this government led by the ANC shall never, not for a single day, fight corruption and fraud because, of course, they are the ones that are deeply involved and are benefiting from such acts. So let us use our power as people of this country to vote them out of power. Let us not have mercy and compassion on them because they are no longer our leaders, but the enemies of our democracy. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you. The next speaker is the Honorable Vessels. The Achbare Voorzitter. Achbare Voorzitter, Chrysler status is for a stel om a regering to let wakker skrik. Maar die Achbare Mabiletsa had vandag weer eens bewys dat die ANC regering nog steeds nie wakker geskrik het nie. Die ANC regering is herhaaldelik gewaarski dat die grijslijst status op ons afstorm en dat daar aksie nodig is. Toch het hulle nie geluister nie. Daar was twee gebiede waar verbetering nodig was om grijslijst status te voorkom. Eerstens toepaslike wetswijzigings. Wat het met die wetswijzigings gebeur? Nou die achtbare Mabiletsu roem dat daar hard gewerk is aan daar die wetswijzigings. Nie achtbare voorzitter, daar is tot op die laatste minuut gewag. En die achtbare lid behoor te weet, want sy is deel van die komitee, waar ons in die komitee gesê het, wat gaan hier aan? Dat daar ondeerdachte wijzigings aan ons voorgehou is, waar die departement en tesorie werkelijk nie gedink het aan die implicaties daarvan. Dit het die proces vertraag en alle partijen, zelfs die ANC lede, was teleergesteld in die wijze waarop die Suri en die ander departementen departement dit hanteer het. Maar dan kom je hier en jy verdedig weer eens die uitvoerende gezag. En dis die probleem. Achbare voorzitter, die weet grijslijst status beteken dat daar nie meer vertrouwen in die regering is. En dit is die probleem. En dan wil die ANC sê, daar is geen economische impact nie. Natuurlijk is daar een economische impact, want dat is niet vertrouwen nie. En nou dat daar weer eens personen gekoppeld word aan terroriste activiteiten en geldwasserij wat in Zuid-Afrika is, beklemt u in die feit dat ons niet die rechte mechanismes het om dit te beperken. nie. Maar wat verwacht ons? Wat kan ons meer verwacht? Want terwijl de Suri hard werk en die minister van Financiën hard werk, om ons weer van die grijslys af te kry, gaan u president, en hy skep totale verwarring, en hy sê, Zuid-Afrika gaan onttrek uit die internationale strafhof. Nou, as hy dit doen, denk bykie mooi, wat word ons, as ons nie meer lid van die internationale strafhof is nie? Denk bykie, dis nie moeilik nie. Ons word dan een veilige hawe vir internationale misdadigers, vir terroriste, Natuurlijk gaan enig iemand uit Afrika toe wil kom as ons nie meer lid van die internationale strafhof is nie. So wat hy sê en waar hy hard werk, laat hy totaal en al ongedaan maak dier een president wat homself in elk geval skuldig maak aan om gekoppel te word aan buitenlandse valita wat onder matrasse weggesteek word. Hoe verwacht hy dat ons nie op die grijslijst eindig nie? 
Maar kom ik zeker hier. Die enigste manier waarop ons werkelijk van die grijslijst kan afkomen, beleggingsvertrouwen kan herstellen en die economie kan herstellen, is om van die ANC-regering ons later aan. Daar is niet twijfel voor aan trend nie. Maar, maar, indien die achtbare Polsen ze luchtkastelen waar wordt, en meneer Malema wordt die president van hierdie staat, dan sê ik voor u, gaan ons niet net op die grijslijst wees nie, ons is sommer onmiddellik op die zwaardlijst. Ek dank u. Thank you, honorable member. The honorable Swart. Order, honorable members. Order. Thank you, House Chair. While South Africa's grey listing has been described as an embarrassing fall from grace, it was not unexpected. The judgment of grey listing refers to a global policy against money laundering and against terrorism financing, money laundering, and South Africa is clearly not measuring up to the standard. Now, the FATF that disposes and bestows the judgment is not some arbitrary body, but an intergovernmental organization and global financial crime watchdog of which South Africa is a member and willing participant. And it identified deficiencies in South Africa's legal framework through compliance and enhances the integrity of that country. Now, the creation of the Fusion Center, which brings together bodies like the NPA, SIU, SARS, Hawks, Crime Intelligence, the State Security Agency, and the FIC is a step in the right direction and is to be welcomed. However, as the FATF pointed out, far more needs to be done. And when one considers the recent revelations of funds that have gone to terrorism organizations, clearly this is the case. The ACDP also calls for an increased political will to carry out the Zonda Commission recommendations. Now, as we know, the commission revealed institutional looting, but alarmingly, precious few prosecutions so far have taken place of those politically well-connected people implicated in the theft of billions of rands, and in certain cases, money laundering was involved as well. Now, the implications of grey listing range from higher interest rates and inflation, the weakening of the rand, which was already factored in, reduced inbound foreign investment, less offshore investment, and increased costs and delays due to greater compliance requirements for South African banks and transactions. The IMF estimates that countries have on average experienced capital outflows equal to 7.6% of GDP after grey listing. This is clearly alarming and so something South Africa cannot afford. Now, the FATF statement made it clear that South Africa was not grey listed, not so much because of a failure of legislation, but a failure to adequately investigate and prosecute money laundering and terrorist finances. The ACDP in government will not fail to ensure that investigations and prosecutions of those involved in money laundering and terrorism financing takes place in a far more effective manner, something that the majority party seems unable to do, resulting in this grey listing. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is the Honourable Heron. I'll start again. A few years ago, a well-known South African politician disingenuously suggested that the falling value of the rand could be reversed by simply picking it up. The comment reflected the inability to understand the link between fiscal integrity and financial well-being in the development of the nation. Now we've been grey listed and we can't simply reverse it by changing the color of the printer ink because it is too relate, related to integrity. National Treasury says the most significant implication to a country that is grey listed is the reputational damage to the country as its effectiveness in combating financial crimes like corruption, money laundering, as well as terror financing are deemed to be below international standards. The grey listing doesn't compel us to do anything. It is effectively a negative finding of our fiduciary character. The Financial Action Task Force encourages its members 
to take information presented in its risk analyses seriously. South Africa's poor reputation for combating financial crimes like corruption and money laundering were at its peak during the FATF's assessment. The outcome of the, of the assessment was therefore not a shock to our markets and has had little or no impact on our economic growth projections. Should government fail to work rapidly to implement the remedial measures to address eight areas of deficiencies by the end of 2024, as agreed, there could be real and detrimental impacts on our economic prospects and our credit rating. Getting off the gray list is therefore important, but the real urgent matter of national importance is the lethal combination of our low economic growth rate, the economy's inability to generate jobs, degrading poverty, a lack of financial support for the unemployed, and our energy crisis, a poisonous cycle. If our country doesn't prioritize addressing these overwhelming failures, then our gray listing will matter little because socioeconomic fractures will continue to weaken our nation and our reputation will become irredeemable. We employ national treasury to get us off the gray list by 2025. But while it threads that needle, restoring South Africa as a desirable destination for legitimate cash flows is a much bigger picture. Job creation and comprehensive social security are critical parts of this picture of common purpose and social cohesion. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Sheikh Imam. Thank you, House Chairperson. You can see that election is looming. It's loud and clear in this house. But you know, one very important question I have for opposition parties in this house. I'd like you all to go back home tonight and ask yourself this question. Wherever we govern, is there corruption or no corruption? And if the answer is there's no corruption, you're lying to yourself. But I find that you're so obsessed with the ANC that your focus of attention is only on the ANC, but yet those that you collude to within this house are also corrupt wherever they are. But you're overlooking that, and I cannot understand why. Someday, in fact, if the ANC was not here, I think Parliament Chairperson would be very boring. Because right now, I think all you want to do is attack. But corruption does exist with all political parties wherever they govern. <laughs> now, I want to say, I want to say to, to particularly to the ANC here, I don't think you must pay too much attention to this gray listing. Because after the gray listing, after the gray listing is going to come, blacklisting. And let me tell you why you're going to get blacklisted. Because of your relationship with the new kids on the block, and that is the Russians, the Chinese, and everybody else, as far as BRICS is concerned, because you're creating this new kid on the block to take on this monster of the West. And we have many puppets in the South belonging to the West, and they'll come here and sing praises of the West. Why nobody raises it when the West, when the West is money laundering? Let's look at terrorism. I hear we're talking about terrorism. Who created Al-Qaeda? Who? The United States of America created and funded them. Who is funding all these terrorist organizations to cause mayhem and chaos all over the world? It is the West that is creating it. But why are we not willing to take on the West? Why do we come here and make it look like that Russia is the enemy? Russia is not the enemy. What Russia is now trying to create a better society where the entire globe can live in peace with stability and prosperity. And I can assure you that if you want the African continent to progress, then you need to ensure you have leadership of the highest caliber, not those that are puppets of the West. That is the problem you're sitting. So we are gray listed only because of your relationship with the Russians, your stance, but your stance is absolutely correct. We have to protect our people in this world from the monsters of the West. Thank you. Order, honorable members.
Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Matafa. Thank you very much, House Chair. Uh, let's start first by assisting Honorable George on the debate that he sponsored so that he understands what gray listing means. This is a process that the Financial Action Task Force's uh, practice of publicly identifying countries with strategic anti-money laundering and countering the financing and terrorism deficiencies. As South Africa, we've been gray listed as we still need to correct only eight strategic deficiencies down from 67 recommended actions for which we have been given the next two years to do so. As the task force says, more progress is required, which we have as a country agreed to work on. So it is not correct, Honorable Sarup and, and, and Kosi Buteles, that the government did nothing, sat back and hoped that we are not gray listed and we have not done anything to respond to the recommended actions. The DA submits a theme for this debate, calling it the economic impact of gray listing and goes on to saying gray listing will have significant implications for South Africa's economy, ranging from less than 1% to 3% reduction in GDP. It is only an economic novice who can make such an economic and informed statement. For a reduction of 1.3 from 1% uh, 1, 1 to 3% in GDP, there needs to be substantial impact on multiple sectors of the economy, not gray listing, not our call for ICC, to be fair, not our call for peace and dialogue between Federation of Russia and Ukraine. House Chair, Honorable George is misleading the House when he says that everyone is condemning Russia. China, India, and 10 other Commonwealth countries abstained from condemning Russia. Three, four actually, other nations actually backed the Russia in its quest for defending themselves from NATO and Ukraine. Honorable Heron, we agree with you when you say that most significant implication for South Africa is reputational damage to the country as it effect, its effectiveness in combating financial crimes like corruption and money laundering, as well as terror financing are deemed to be below standards. In addition, a related implication arises from consequential action taken with regards to cross-border transactions, particularly possible action taken by foreign banks that provide corresponding banking services. It should be noted that the task force does not require enhanced due diligence measures to be applied, but rather that all jurisdictions take account of this in its risk analysis. As per Honorable Stoltz's explanation, which we see as the most correct one of the, all the speakers who are here, of the implications of gray listing, the above also means that financial institutions are expected to undertake more enhanced monitoring for their own business reasons, or as may be required by their own laws. Institutions in South Africa that engage in cross-border trade and other activities may be subject to higher levels of customer due diligence by financial institutions outside of South Africa. In practice, this means being more thorough, processing and vetting clients and understanding the source of their funds. If we demonstrate, as we have been doing, that South Africa has taken a strong and credible step to prevent and get out of gray listing, this cost of gray listing will be reduced. In the case of South Africa, none of the items in the action plan we have been given relate to directly to preventative measures in respect of the financial sector, reflecting significant progress since the mutual evaluation in the application of risk-based approach in supervision of bank and insurers. At the current rate, we are progressing in addressing outstanding strategic deficiencies. The impact of financial stability will be limited as well as the cost of doing business within South Africa. Continuously improving the integrity of the financial system, not merely a task force exercise, but rather part of government's objective for regulation on the financial sector. National Treasury is particularly working to continue to strengthen and expand anti-money laundering and combating terror finance systems in the financial sector to minimize perceived risks relating to the sector, including from new and emerging risks. The biggest economic risk of being relisted is related to the withdrawal of banking and payment services necessary for trade 
remittances and other transfers and economic growth. This is the real risk, not the issue of Russia and Ukraine or any other issue that was put to the table. We are on the path of working on the eight outstanding strategic deficiencies in line with meeting the deadline for next mutual evaluation in 2024. The report of which will be referred to the task force October 2025 plenary meeting. If one reads the press release of the DA party and the sponsor for this debate, one cannot find a single practical proposal in the statement on what are they proposing that we should do. The NC government is already doing. For example, they say the following, we must restore confidence in our financial system. We must put pressure on government to work closely with financial institutions and the security cluster. And government must commit to rebuild institutional capacity. All they are saying, is what we are doing already. It really shows that there is a crisis in the DA party on the finance front. There was a time that we used to go to get some content from them. Today, it has generated to slogans and uh, rhetoric. So what are we doing to get out of the gray list and not just whine about it, like we had the sponsor of this debate do today? There are two critical actions that we have to demonstrate. Firstly, assessment of the letter of the law, the legal framework which has already largely been compl completed so that their technical compliance can be demonstrated by the adequacy of our laws dealing with money laundering and combating of terrorism financing. Secondly, and this is the more difficult part, relates to assessment of the spirit of the law, effectiveness. Effectiveness measures refer to immediate outcomes and that requires demonstrating their success of implementation, the number of successful prosecutions, the number of freezing orders of funds, policy and operational documentation. The 12 departmental and state entity working group have completed their work on legislative reform and are now seized with the effectiveness measures of the legislative reform, the necessary, the, the General Laws Amendment Act, which amended five pieces of legislation as an omnibus piece of legislation and the protection of constitutional democracy Against Terrorism and Related Activities Amendment Act have really demonstrated to the Financial Action Task Force our capability and willingness in dealing with the necessary legislative changes. The legislative amendments in the two bills address 16 of the 20 uh, technical compliance deficiencies and are the first important and very significant remedial steps to bring realist into an end when considered by the task force plenary in 2025 in the month of October. Cabinet has mandated the Interdepartmental Committee on Anti-Money Laundering and Countering Terror Financing to address the identified deficiencies expeditiously. This includes overseeing the implementation of the National Strategy on Anti-Money Laundering and Countering Terror Financing and tracking progress in addressing the identified deficiencies. The law enforcement agencies, including the National Prosecutions Authority, are implementing an integrated action plan to ensure a sustained increase in investigations and prosecutions of serious and complex money laundering cases. The action plan focuses on cases involving professional money laundering, networks and third party money laundering, as well as identifying, investigating and prosecuting terror financing activities in line with South Africa's risk profile. The commitment from the presidency through the Cabinet Committee on Justice, Crime Prevention and Security is to enforce the implementation of the high level goals, ensuring that all relevant agencies and departments are addressing the deficiencies identified by the Financial Action Task Force. On effectiveness in implementation, the second major part of responding to gray listing this work has already started and will require our oversight as parliament across the least five committees in the National Assembly. The actions that have commenced on effectiveness relates to one, national risk assessment, two, regulatory issues involving various supervisory requirements and beneficial ownership information, three, investigations, prosecutions, for features relating to money laundering largely by the security cluster. Fourthly, terrorist financing investigations and prosecution, as well as targeted financial sanctions relating to terrorism financing and proliferation financing. This is the work that has started and the country through the coordinated work of the 12 institutions, 
will need to demonstrate substantial progress in implementing recommended actions together with the action plans, each of the four identified areas. In terms of oversight, this means that the five committees of the National Assembly will, be, will need to assess whether the department and entities tasked in addressing these effectiveness plans reflected in the outcomes. The following are the two critical indicators. One, to what extent is the outcome being achieved with example of specific factors and take into account the level of technical compliance and contextual factors. Two, what can be done to improve effectiveness and where possible make recommendations to improve the ability to achieve specific outcomes. One member is going to fumble because he's not listening and this task are for parliament. Having said that, we want to thank the sponsor of the debate for giving the ANC the opportunity of explaining how we are getting South Africa out of grey listing, since he himself has not provided any practical solutions. We need to always use these occasions to address the essence of the problems that we face and not trivialize important matters by misleading the House, because the DA needs to try and gain traction for the next year's ANC and uh, next year's elections and look relevant. The ANC leaves and the ANC leads. I thank you, House Chair. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Alexander. Thank you very much, House Chair. Honorable Members of Parliament, we are painfully aware that South Africa has been grey listed. While the short term consequences may appear insignificant, failure to address the issues by 2025 will result in severe repercussions. The longer we remain on this list, the more challenging it becomes to access international finance markets. Our reputation, business opportunities, and investment prospects are all at risk. Increased scrutiny from financial institutions and regulators will make transacting with this country more costly and difficult. Heightened monitoring coupled with increased transactional costs due to mandatory funding source verification will result in delays in transactions. This burden on our business and our nation's, nation's standing in the global market is not something we can afford to ignore. Moreover, Treasury departments, particularly those reliant on global trade, will be significantly impacted. Incre increased red tape and more stringent uh, uh, due diligence for offshore trading will lead to a decline in trade revenue. As we face these challenges, we must also be content with the possibility of regulators in the US, EU, and the UK restricting transactions with South African banks. Being grey listed has far reaching implications for foreign investment. Many international financial institutions may limit their dealings with us and hindering businesses or foreign investment for this nation. These restrictions add to our ever growing list of challenges that we face, including low growth and our ongoing energy crisis. The urgency for South Africa to adapt to the climate change and secure finances from international partners is paramount. And at COP26, the US, EU, UK, France, and Germany pledged 8.5 billion of support towards our transition to a low economy, a carbon economy. However, gray listing will burden international finance flow to and from South Africa with higher compliance obligations and transactional costs. Attracting additional foreign investment and companies to support our environmental, social, and governance objectives will prove increasingly difficult. Yet this government has sought to fit to leverage the predicament as an opportunity to strengthen financial crime prevention, as if this opportunity did not exist prior to us being grey listed. I'd like to remind this parliament that our role and duties as elected public officials is that we are duty bound to represent the people of this country. We are their voice and we are accountable to the people of South Africa. And as we discuss gray listing and the criteria to be removed from this list, isn't it ironic that the president himself has been accused of bribery, money laundering and concealing a crime at his Palapala Pala farm? These allegations would not intimidate an innocent person to set the record straight, if that's in fact what needs to be done. Honourable Member, your we time is now expired. Honourable Thank Jaffa. you very much. Honourable Jafta, are you on the platform? The Honourable Jafta yes, from honorable the AIC. Yes, please proceed. Thanks, Honourable Chair. The placing of South Africa on a list of countries under increased monitoring or grey listing has a particular historic 
fiscal context. In 2009, the Financial Action Task Force lamented our country's lax financial regulatory mechanisms to stem out money laundering and finance, financing of terrorism. 14 years later, there is no concrete regulatory regime to quell illicit financial flows and money laundering. It does occur to us that we have not paid sufficient attention to these international crimes. For example, despite South Africa signing the multilateral convention to implement tax treaty related measures to prevent base erosion, money laundering and profit shifting, this parliament only approved this convention later, late last year, six years after it was signed in 2017. It is worth reminding ourselves of some of the gray areas the Financial Action Task Force flagged in its reporting on South Africa. They include, amongst others, the lack of sustained increased control in outbound mutual legal assistance requests that help facilitate money laundering, the lack of improved risk-based supervision of designated non-financial business and professions, and inadequate and up, unupdated TF risk assessment to inform the implementation of comprehensive national counterfinancing of a terrorism strategy. Honorable Chair, if international and enhanced regulatory controls are not put in place such as measures such as measures designed to investigate and prosecute serious and complex money laundering and the full range of TF activities, we will continue to be in the same gray listing group along, alongside failed democracies such as the Democratic Republic of Congo, Syria, and Nigeria. While state capture eroded the capacity of the state to fight money laundering and base erosion, it did awaken us to some of the glaring financial misdemeanors, which must constantly be monitored. We cannot afford as a destination for foreign direct investment uh, and foreign portfolio inflows in to ignore the financial action, the financial action task force findings. We have to re-engineer our enforcement capacity and stem the tide against international crimes. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Minister of Finance. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, the debate about grey listing and its impact is an important debate for all South Africans who care about the country and its prospects. In this regard, I want to thank Honorable George for requesting this debate. It is also an issue that is very attractive for the opposition parties. Because it is easy to portray it as some kind of international criticism of South Africa. What I hoped for was that having criticized us for our failures, our colleagues on the opposition benches would probably offer us some solutions. Order, honorable members, order. Order, honorable Paulson, you had the opportunity to debate. What? Order. What is the solution we're being granted? Remove the ANC. That's the solution which I've seen coming at cross. We need some contribution. I've always, when I take this platform, genuinely request opposition parties as South Africans to debate with us even outside this room where it is necessary to offer some solution to complex and challenging problems confronting our nation. 
I'm grateful to Honorable Vassals because he draws a distinction between two things, gray listing and black listing, which are both things the uh, FATF does. Unfortunately, South Africa is not black listed, but gray listed. That distinction is important. So what I want to do today, I want to reflect on gray listing and on government's attitude to the underlying issues. And, and I'll leave it for, other play, for others to play politics with the issue. The first thing to say is that being gray listed is a serious matter. The FATF process is rigorous one, and we don't think that the decision to gray list South Africa was a frivolous one, or that it was taken for frivolous re reason. That's a, from our side, from subjectively, if we don't take that decision, we're not going to be operating in order to change not the frivolous one. The fact of the matter is that South Africa does have serious challenges of crime and corruption, and that these generate a lot of proceeds of crime. If there are a lot of proceeds of crime, our anti-money laundering regime must be sufficiently strong. But let me say, a lot is being said about the implications. What are the possible implications of gray listing? The first one is to see capital outflows. Have we seen capital outflows in this economy which we can attribute to, to gray listing? My answer is no. An example, in April this month, we've had positive inflows more than any period between 2017 and now. Those are facts. Those are facts. You can go to the central bank to, to get you those figures. This, the second thing is what, how do corresponding financial institutions relate to our institutions? We have not seen any negative reaction by corresponding financial institutions to our institutions. So what do we have? What we have is largely a politicization of the problem than a focus on the resolution of the problem. We need to fix this, not because FATF tells us to do it or because it is embarrassing that we're greatly said but because crime and corruption are a major threat to our economy and prosperity. That's why we do it. That's why we do it. Not because, the, that's the, that is why the president responded in October last year with a comprehensive response to the recommendation of the Zondo Commission, committing to fix up our institution so that it, they can deal better with the crime and corruption. I'm going to come back to this point. What have we done in order to strengthen these institutions? So I want to say that even though we don't think that gray listing has itself caused any significant impo Im impact yet, as I've indicated, we have to recognize that the reasons we were gray listed do not have major economic, do have major economic consequences as I have indicated about crime and corruption. If we don't deal with the crime and corruption more effectively, then we will struggle to solve our economic challenges. The importance of dealing with, with the reasons for gray listing is the most important point I want to make today. And it is from this starting point that we have been proceeding in responding to gray listing. Part of the reason FATF gray listed us is that they assert the statutory basis of our anti money London regime, identify a number of deficiencies that could be exploited by those who wish to hide ill, Ill forgotten, Ill gotten gains from, our, from crime and corruption. In this regard, as members, we all know, we led a process that last year that to pass a range of statutory amendments that address all these gaps. Thanks to you members for that. These changes, are now in force and we think that they will go some way to close the gap through which 
dirty money enters into and circulate in the economy. They will also make it easier to identify the beneficiaries of transactions that involve the proceeds of crime and corruption. Both having legal tools available to identify and curb money laundering is not by itself enough. We also need to put up our game with respect to enforcing the laws, identifying wrongdoers, and prosecuting them successfully. I think we, we're missing each other a little bit. As an order, know, as order might, members will know, our law enforcement yeah. agencies Maybe. were deliberately weakened during this era of state capture. We are making progress in addressing the weaknesses that exist, but this is not the work of the day. Even with le leadership that are not tainted by state corruption, it takes time to build the skills and capacity. In this regard, we tabled the budget in February. What did we say in that budget to strengthen these institutions? Let me go back to that point because it seems membership members have forgotten about it. The budget in, in February increased the budget of the relevant agencies by 14 billion over the medium term. This includes 1.3 billion to the National Prosecuting Authority to implement the findings of the Zondo Commission. 265 million for the Financial Intelligence Center to transcend its capacity and nearly 1 billion for the hawks. That is the responding to what the president said when he addressed this, this house in October, that we are going to strengthen these institutions. These resources are directed towards strengthening these institutions. Teams with, with criminal justice system are also identifying priority cases, resource gaps, and training needs so that much progress is made much quick, more quickly. I've already said we are doing these things not because we want to get off the gray list as soon as possible, but because we want to address the reasons we are gray listed in the first place. Those reasons are a threat to the future and they should not be a subject to petty politics. If we act to implement the action plan we've agreed to with FATF, we can and we'll get off the gray list sometime next year. If we do not, then we'll be significantly impacted financially and economically. Part of the process is to have an interface with FATF every three months. Starting from next week, a meeting we're going to have with them in, in, in Mauritius. In, in Mauritius too. That's where they want us. It's not us who want to go there. We hope. Order, point, honorable members, order. A, a, a point has been made. A point has been made that part of our other challenges is our non-aligned position. South Africa has adopted from the, the day of democracy a non-aligned position. A non-aligned position is not the one that suggests we're moving from the West as if we were in the West in the first place. We're in nobody's land. We're in our own land. And we're not uh, uh, subjecting ourselves to any specific uh, ideological group or geopolitical group in the in the world, but taking non-aligned position. And that is known to assert, as some have said, that we're moving to, to, for, from the West is misleading. In so far as allegation about Agoa, I want to assure this house that South Africa has a strategic relationship with the USA as we do with any other nation. I must repeat this. We have a strategic relationship with the United States of America as we do with any other nations. My colleague, the Minister of Trade and Industry and Competition has got a relationship with the counterpart in the United States. No hint whatsoever has been made about us being chased out of Agoa. I do have a relationship with my counterpart from the United States of America. I met her as late as two weeks ago in the World Bank meeting. No hint of any, in fact, they were saying they committed to Agoa. So these uh, mongering tactics, I don't think that they're in the interest of, of, of South Africa. Uh, we, I don't think they're in the interest of South Africa. 
This debate really should have been, if it was concerned genuinely, it should have focused on how do we as a nation, not as political parties, contribute to taking South Africa out of the gray list. That's what this debate about. That's what this debate about. I suspect, I suspect, well, as we run up to the elections, we're going to have more of these debates from this side of the opposition. My sense what we've done good this side was say to help us to explain the work we're doing as the ANC, which I thank you for that. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Honorable members, that concludes the debate. I now request the secretary to read the third order. Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services on Constitution 18th Amendment Bill. I now call upon the Honorable Magwanisha who will introduce the report. Thank you very much, House Chairperson, Deputy President, Honorable Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members. The committee having considered the Constitution 18th Amendment Bill, reports the bill without amendment. The bill proposes to amend Section 6 of the Constitution to include South African Sign Language as an official language to promote the rights of persons who are deaf and hard of hearing. The bill further promotes inclusive and, su and substantive equality and prevent or eliminate unfair discrimination on the grounds of disability as guaranteed by section nine of the constitution. The bill was introduced and referred to the committee on the 12th of January, 2023 the committee was briefed by the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development on the content of the bill on the 27th of January, 2023. In response to the call for public comment, the committee received 58 written submissions from individuals and organizations. The majority of the submissions were in support of the bill. The committee noted the views expressed by the few that were opposed to the bill, but submit that the recognition of South African Sign Language as a 12th official language is an important step forward for the realization of the rights of persons who are deaf and hard of hearing. Although South African Sign Language is not a universal language, the committee believes that South Africa is in the promotion and the development of South Africa's sign language that the various dialects are also recognized. In terms of section 74, subsection four of the constitution, a bill that amends the constitution may not include any provisions other than the constitutional amendments and matters connected with the amendments. The committee notes that the use of South African sign language is mentioned in other legislation, such as the use of official languages Act number 12 of 2012, the South African Schools Act number 84 of 1996, the Pan-African South African Language Board Act 59 of 1995. The adoption of this bill could impact on such legislation. Relevant departments administering this and related legislations to take note of this constitutional amendment, recognizing South Africa sign language as an official language and consider whether the adoption of the bill may require consequential amendment for the purposes of clarifying the status of South African sign language as expressed in the constitution. I hereby present this report for your kind consideration and support. I've already greeted you, Deputy President. Thank you, Honorable Member. 
I will now recognize political parties wishing to make a declaration the opportunity to do so. The DA. Uh, thank you, Honorable House Chair. Honorable members, this bill, which we support wholeheartedly, has had a long and very slow passage from its inception until today. In 1995, the University of the Free State began offering the very first sign language course with the active involvement of our uh, Deputy Chief Whip, Dr. Anagel Rotrich, who was attached to the university at that time. This matter first served before the Constitutional Review Committee of this Parliament in 2007, and it took from then until the 23rd of November 2017, until it was finally recommended by the Constitutional Review Committee. This is sadly an example of Parliament dragging its feet to the detriment of approximately 4 million deaf and hearing impaired South Africans. And today, a further six years later, finally this very deserving piece of legislation is uh, before the National Assembly. Recognition as the 12th official language of South Africa will enable not only the, those 4 million South Africans uh, to fully participate, but will finally bestow the proper recognition on South African Sign Language and place it on an equal footing with other languages. We offer our warm congratulations to all those who drove this bill, including the uh, Honorable Niva Jaffin, uh, Mr. Bruno Drachen, who I believe is here today, and uh, Dr. Andre Lotrich. We support this bill. Thank you, Honorable Member. The EFF. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, the EFF welcomes this amendment bill to the Constitution. This bill affirms the right of this parliament to periodically assess the efficacy and the constitution in protecting rights and advocating for the cause for which a free and democratic South Africa ought to stand for. This also shows that there is nothing wrong with amending the constitution every now and then because society evolves and our understanding of issues evolves too. This bill seeks to validate that the South African sign language is a language a validation that should never have been an issue because no one is born or willingly wants to be deaf. We all know the statistics that we have 4 million people in South Africa who use sign language. The amendment of the constitution to recognize sign language as one of the official languages should not even have been a matter of debate. This house must affirm that it has powers to include those excluded by lack of foresight of those who drafted the constitution. This is the same attitude we adopted when we moved for the amendment of the property cause to permit land expropriation without compensation. Yes, the drafters of the constitution missed the importance of land as a means of decolonizing our society, as they missed the importance of including sign language as one of the officially recognized languages. This exercise should take place almost every aspect in our lives in this country. The constitution ought to be reviewed periodically to ascertain if it still fulfills the aspirations of the vast majority of our people who remain excluded and marginalized. This bill should have been passed during the first years of our democracy. It is a sad indictment of the government bodies progressively pushing the inclusivity of sign language. The amendment of the constitution in this regard must be followed by the introduction of sign language in our school curriculum. And it's very important because we have many kids that we have given birth to that are deaf and cannot communicate, cannot access schools, cannot have a means to communicate with us. This, this is important in order to make every member of society to be able to communicate with those who cannot hear. Sign language must not be used to further patronize deaf people. It must be a language for all to ensure that all deaf people feel a part of and parcel of every daily conservation of this country too. So therefore, the AFF supports this bill. Thank you. The IFP. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. 
the Ingada Freedom Party has always been a strong and avid supporter of the inclusion of South African Sign Language as an official language in promoting the rights of persons who are hearing impaired. As far as as far back as 2009, this matter was raised and advocated by former FPMP Dr. Mario Oriane Ambrosini on several occasions before he at <clears throat> this house. Dr. Ambrosini raised the critical issue of the importance of sign language as a tool for communication and the greater inclusion of hearing impaired in our education systems, workplaces, and society. He would often lament that at the time, South Africa was still one of the very few countries in the world that had not yet recognized sign language as an official language. And up until his untimely passing in 2014, would, together with his legislative assistance, Ms. Stan Bennett, make re repeated calls for more significant efforts to promote the use of sign language passionately, advocate for the rights and access to public services of people with hearing impaired disabilities. The bill before us today will significantly enhance and advance the cultural acceptance of South African Sign Language and show the full realization of the rights of persons who are hearing impaired to the equal protection and benefit of the law and that the human dignity promote inclusivity, substantive equality, as well as the prevention of unfair discrimination on the ground of disability as is guaranteed by section nine of the constitution. This bill not only takes a crucial step towards promoting the inclusion and accessibility for the hearing impaired community, but also aligns with the best international norms, standards, and protection of human dignity and rights. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, ratified by South Africa in 2007, recognizing the importance of sign language and facilitating the full participation of hearing impaired individuals in society. Recognizing sign language as an official language, South Africa will be demonstrating its commitment to upholding the rights of its citizens with disabilities and promoting such inclusivity, which includes the promotion of the language and culture on the hearing impaired community, as well as fostering greater social cohesion in society. Honorable Member, your time is now full expired. Of the report and the bill. I thank you, Honorable House. Thank you. The FF Plus. Thank you, Achbar Voorzitter. Voorzitter, the 18 de wijziging van die grondwet is a geweldige, massieve stap in die rechte richting om die marginalisering van die dove gemeenskap aan te spreken. En ons verwelkom dit. Die vrijheid om plus ondersteun hier die wijzigingswetsontwerp en die wijziging van die grondwet om dit in te sluit en een ambtelijke taal te maak. Achbare voorzitter, wat echter wel waar is, is dat net om een taal en die grondwet als ambtelijk te herken, niet noodwendig genoeg is. Nie. Ons zien dat ons elf ambtelijke talen thans heet en nu twaalf gaan heen. Maar dat in die meeste gevallen praktisch daar eindelijk slechts één supertaal is. En dit is Engels en die reis is net in die grondwet erken als ambtelijk. Als we gaan kijken wie toegang heeft in scholen om in alle eigen talen school te gaan, dan worden die meeste Zuid-Afrikaners uitgesluit en is hulle niet in staat gesteld om in alle taal school te gaan. 
30 jaar van democratie en ons het nie vordering gemaakt om meer toegankelijkheid ten opzichte van schoolonderricht daar te stellen. Dit is een skande. En daarom moet het ook niet net bly dat hier die taal net ingesluit wordt in die grondwet en niet werkelijk daar uitvoering en implementering daarvan geschiet nie. Daar moet implementering wees en die achtbare lid is correct. Is dit niet een skande dat de kind steeds wat bijvoorbeeld is Koza is of is die Zulu is of Sepedi is steeds net een keer sê het om in Engels of Afrikaans school te gaan nie en steeds nie van graad 1 tot een metriek in hoogtaal te kan school te gaan. Dit is een skan en dit is die punt. Maar het is u wat nou in die regering is. Je moet niet net naar die verleden kyk nie, kyk na die hede. En dan moet ons hier die insluiting en die marginalisering van die dove gemeenschap wat ons aanspreek hierdoor, moet ons deervoer en niet net bly by lee beloftes en by net insluiting in die grondwet nie. Ons moet werkelijk implementering daarin geskiet. Je weet, die, die ambtelijke taalwetgeving het meer as 12 jaar geneem om wet te word. Wat gaan nou gebeur? The Use of Official Languages Act was only written into legislation in 2012. Up until then, it was just the constitution. And yet, up until now, a lot of provinces still don't have official languages policy. How many years later? More than 12 years later, and they don't. So this sign language should be acknowledged and the implementation should also occur. It should only be a constitutional amendment. I thank you. The ACDP. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, this is a significant day in Parliament as we approve the Constitution 18th Amendment Bill, which will result in sign language becoming an official language. And this will promote the rights of persons who are deaf or hard of hearing. Now, I remember back in 2007, where the Constitutional Review Committee started to debate this issue and consider it, but we are pleased that today, this is a day of celebration, not only for the estimated 4 million hearing impaired people in the country, but for each one of us who understand and appreciate the challenges facing deaf and hard of hearing people. And we in the ACDP would like to honor all people who are hearing impaired and who have overcome their adversity, such as the Honorable Nivod Druchen, who is a sterling performer in the Justice Portfolio Committee. The committee has also been able to see exactly how hearing impaired people are impacted and let us also remember that hearing impaired people have lost their lives. Let us remember the fire in the Northwest School for the Deaf in August 2014. Three teenage girls died and 23 learners were injured at that tragic fire. The South African Human Rights Commission found there was a systemic non-compliance with minimum building safety and fire standards for residential facilities in special schools, particularly in the Northwest province. One trusts that the passage of this bill will not only recognize sign language as an official language, but also focus attention on the plight of hearing impaired people, and indeed of all disabled people in the country. The ACDP enthusiastically supports this bill, and we'd like to express our love to those in the back by this sign language, which says, I love you. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The UDM, the ATM, good. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, Section 1 of our Constitution establishes South Africa as one sovereign democratic state founded on values that include human dignity, the achievement of equality and the advancement of human rights and freedoms. Section 9.3 of the Constitution prohibits discrimination against anyone on the grounds of disability. It is our constitutional duty to build a nation which is inclusive and non-discriminatory. For too long, special needs, differently abled or disabled South Africans have been relegated to navigate a state that is unprepared and underdeveloped for them. Exclusion and an assault on their human dignity 
is the most common experience as the infrastructure and services of the state, the provinces and our towns and cities simply do not accommodate their needs. This is not so much about resources, it is about consciousness. When we enact the 18th Amendment to the South African Constitution to recognize South African Sign Language as the 12th official South African language, we take one giant step for rights of deaf South Africans, but we take only one small step for the human dignity and rights of all South Africans who are excluded or underserviced because of their disability. Chairperson, we must take this step and we welcome the recognition of South African Sign Language as our 12th official language. But our state, our national, provincial, and local governments must do more for all of, all of those who, who are excluded because of their disability. We support the bill. Thank you. The NFP. Thank you, House Chairperson. Allow me to acknowledge the president, the presence of the deputy president. Seems to be well groomed. Yeah. The National Freedom Party notes the report of the Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services. Very importantly, very importantly, Chairperson, I think that this bill has been long overdue, and we must admit that, of course, discrimination in any sort is not acceptable in the country. Whilst we acknowledge and we will support this bill, we are calling on particularly local government. You know, they say talk is cheap. So we can come here and, 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 and admire this piece of legislation. We can introduce it, we can pass it, but I think we need to go out there and implement it. And maybe perhaps this house, Chief Wop, should put measures in place and time frames to ensure that all local governments particularly introduce sign language uh, in their municipalities, in their local government. But at the same time, I want to say while we welcome this and we believe that it is long overdue, it's the right thing to do. Let us not forget also the Khoi and San language. The Khoi and San, in my understanding, came to this country over 60,000, let me repeat, 60,000 years ago. So that's how old the language of the Khoi and San is. And despite that, they still have not had any recognition in terms of their language. So I think it is very important after having passed this that we consider as the 13th official language in this country, the Khoi and San language to accommodate the Khoi and San. Of course, for those of you who may not know, the Khoi and San is the first indigenous nation, the rightful heirs to the land in this country, the rightful heirs to the water in this country, the rightful heirs to the wealth in this country. So let us not forget that. So, so if you want to talk about redistribution and things, let's not forget the Khoi and San. Chairperson, the National Freedom Party supports the bill table here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member. The AIC. Thank you, Chair. The AIC supports the bill with no declarations, Chair. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cope. The PAC. The PAC supports the, the bill, Chair. Thank you. Al Jama. The ANC. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, I would like to represent the, uh, welcome the Deputy President as well, recognize him, apologies. I would also like to welcome my visitors at the back and my special visitor from Gallaudet University. She is the incoming provost of that university, which is my alma mater. It's really wonderful that you could be here to witness this moment. For the deaf community of South Africa, this is enough of moment. The time has come, the time is now. This moment, the deaf community of South Africa, including myself, have been waiting for. Human dignity 
in its most basic form is an attribute of humanity. Every human being has an inherent right to human dignity. Dignity, broadly speaking, and at a minimum, encompasses the inalienable, inherent, and intrinsic worth or values of each individual. The worth of a person has no price, it admits no substitute, and it cannot be traded off for anything in the world. The Constitution refers to the Bill of Rights as the cornerstone of democracy in South Africa, which enshrines the rights of all people in our country and affirms the democratic values of human dignity, equality, and freedom. Much has been achieved by the ANC government in terms of progressive realization of human rights. However, persons with hearing disabilities, those who are deaf, hard of hearing, and deafblind, they continue to experience high levels of marginalization and exclusion due to the social, psychological, and physiological and structural challenges. The exclusion of deaf persons challenges and limits their social participation and integration in society. Our government has a responsibility to ensure that deaf people are not deprived of their human rights on the basis of their disability. South African Sign Language is the primary language for deaf people, deaf persons in South Africa that constitutes an important element of our country's linguistic diversity and cultural heritage. The Constitution 18th Amendment Bill provides for the elevation of South African Sign Language from its current position that the government should promote and support, it elevates it to an official language recognized by the Constitution and the state. This is an important and progressive intervention for the millions of South Africans with hearing disabilities. This amendment will place greater attention on the needs of persons with disabilities, particularly those who are deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. Persons with disabilities face a wide variety of barriers, including access to education, healthcare, social services, justice, and also employment opportunities. As the motto says, nothing about us without us. We want to achieve the full participation and equalization of opportunity for, by, and with persons with disabilities. Honorable Chairperson, the journey of making South African Sign Language an official language has been a long one. The first submission by DEFSA to the Constitutional Review Committee was made in 2007. The second submission was made in 2013 and the third in 2015. In 2016, deaf people and supporters marched in all nine provinces and handed over a petition signed by 32,000 people to our national parliament. In 2018, the Department of Basic Education recognized SSL as a home language. Last year, 2022, was the fourth year that our matriculants could do their subject SASL as exams for grade 12. And we'd like to thank the Department of Education for that progressive move. Following deliberations and much consideration, the NA and the NCOP approved the recommendation by the Constitutional Review Committee to make SASL the 12th official language. The president in his 2020 State of the Nation address acknowledge the progress making SSL an official status. Today, the Constitutional 18th Amendment is before this House. Recognizing SSL as an official language will encourage government to allocate adequate resources to support its official status. It will encourage the state to invest in SSL interpreters and begin to conscientize society in a more progressive direction. 
when considering the issue of access to justice, it has been reported that there are currently about 11 SASL interpreters employed by the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. The promulgation of SASL has urged the Department of Justice to embark on reskilling the current crop of court interpreters. They have put aside funds for SASL training as part of the 2023-2024 programs. This move is encouraged. To echo the words of the late former Deputy Minister, Professor Tengi Wemkize, South African Sign Language is, not, is a right and not a privilege and is the language of the first line of communication for deaf persons. This bill sends out an important message that South Africa is a caring nation and recognizes and protects the rights of those who are vulnerable in society. The ANC supports the Constitutional Amendment 18 Amendment Bill. Honorable Chair, I would like to thank the Justice Ministry and the staff of the Department of Justice um, and some of the members who have who have always been here supporting this bill, supporting the journey, some who have retired already. Um, thank you for the support in making SASL an official language. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now recognize the Honorable Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair. House Chair, I move that this report be adopted. It is such a, a wonderful uh, breakthrough. Thank you. The motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? No objections agreed to. The secretary will read the fourth order. Second reading, Constitution 18th Amendment Bill. Honorable members, as there is no list of speakers, are there any objections to the bill being passed? Honorable members, this bill may be passed by the assembly with a supporting vote of two thirds of its members. A supporting vote of 267 votes in support of the bill is therefore required. Although a division has not been demanded, members are required to record their support for the bill. The bells will be rung for five minutes to alert the members. Recording stopped.
voting procedure will be used for this recording of votes. Firstly, in order to establish a quorum, I would request the table to confirm that we have the requisite number of members physically present in the chamber and on the virtual platform to take a decision. Party whoops will then be given the opportunity to confirm the number of their members present and indicate if they vote for or against the question. A member who wishes to abstain or vote against the party vote may do so by informing the chairperson. This bill falls within the ambit of section 74, subsection two of the constitution. A supporting vote of two thirds of the members of the assembly is therefore needed. Do we have a quorum? Honourable members, we do have the number for the virtual platform. However, however, we are going to request the whips to confirm the number of the members present in the house. Will the whips assist the NA table? I would have thought that the NA table would have the capacity to count the number of members in the house because it's just a recording of the vote, not the division. And we are dealing with an amendment to the constitution. It's a very important matter. I will thus now ask the whips to confirm the numbers of their members present on the virtual platform as well as in the house so that we can make sure that we do have the requisite quorum. The ANC. Thank you very much, House Chair. House Chair, ANC here in person is uh, 41. On the virtual platform is 143, totaling up to 184. We vote in full support. Thank you. The DA. Person in the house, we are 18. On line 50, that is 68 voting in favor. Remember, we're just recording the number of your members present, and we will come to the confirmation of the vote. The EFF? No, I was chair. We are 21 on the virtual platform and 10 in the house. What did you want? Thank you. IFP. Thank you, Chairperson. We are four in the house, six on the virtual, that's 10. Thank you. FF Plus. Thank you, House Chairperson. We are six on the virtual platform and two in the house, that's eight. ACDP. Thank you, House Chair. One on the platform, one in the house, that's two. Thank you. The UDM. The ATM. Good. House Chair, one in the house. Thank you. The NFP. Chair, one in the house. Thank you. The AIC. One in the virtual. Thank you. Cope, PAC, and Al Jama. One, Chair. The PAC is one. Al Jama, not present. Can I get the total, please? Honourable members, we do have the requisite quorum and will now proceed for the party whips to confirm the votes of their members. 
the doors will remain closed and the virtual platform will remain locked during this period. The ANC. Thank you, Chair. ANC vote in full support with 184. Thank you. Thank you. The DA. Chairperson, Chairperson. 68 in favor. The EFF. The EFF, what did you want? We vote in full support. Thank you. The IFP. Chair, the IFP has 10 in favor. Thank you. Thank you. The FF plus. The chair, we are eight in favor. Thank you. The ACDP. Two in favor. Thank you. Thank you. The UDM. ATM. Good. Uh, chairperson, one in favor. Thank you. The NFP. The AIC. One in favor, Chairperson. Thank you. Cope. The PAC. One in favor, Chair. Thank you. Al Jama. Not here. Is there any member that want to wish or abstain or vote differently? There's no indication. We have all members now recorded their support. The voting session is closed. Order, honorable members, the result is as follows. There's 306 members who have now voted in favor. There's no abstentions and no one voted against. As the required majority has been obtained in terms of section 74, subsection two of the constitution, the bill has been passed. The secretary will read the fifth order. Consideration of report of Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services on Certificate of Exemption submitted to National Assembly for approval in terms of Section 46.4 of uh, Regulation of Interception of Communication and Provision of Communication Related Information Act 2002. I will now call upon the Honorable Magwanisha to introduce the report. Thank you very much, House Chairperson, His Excellency, the Deputy President, Honorable Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members. On the 15th of March, 2023, the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services submitted a certificate of exemption for approval by the National Assembly in terms of section 46, subsection 4A of the Regulation of Interception of Communications and Provisions of Communications Related Information Act of 2002, known as RECA. In terms of RECA, no person may manufacture, assemble, possess, sell, purchase, or advertise any listed equipment. The Act permits the Minister to exempt any law enforcement agency from the prohibited acts of possessing and manufacturing listed equipment on application and in consultation with the Cabinet members responsible for communications, defense, intelligence services, and policing. For such period and on such conditions as the minister may determine. The act requires the minister to be satisfied that an exemption is in the public interest or special circumstances exist which justify the exemption. And in the case of manufacturing or assembly of listed equipment, that the purpose for which it will be manufactured or assembled is reasonably necessary. The minister explains in a letter dated 10th March 2022 that the Minister of Police had applied in terms of the Act 
for the SAPS to be exempted from the prohibited act of possessing, purchasing, manufacturing, and assembling of listed equipment. The necessary consultation with the relevant ministers has taken place who indicated their support. The certificate issued includes certain conditions to regulate the use and prevent the abuse of the listed equipment, and it will apply for a period of five years. The Minister of Police must also table a report in Parliament containing information on the number of authorizations issued for the use of the equipment, the categories of use of the listed equipment, and the response to such use. The committee acknowledges the critical role that the interception of communication plays in securing our state, but as well as the covert interception of communication that RECA permits is highly invasive of privacy. In this regard, the committee notes the constitutional court judgment in the 2021 Amapungane case, which found RECA to be unconstitutional, but suspended the declaration of invalidity for three years in order that parliament may rectify the constitutional defects. The committee recommends that the National Assembly approve the certification of exemption submitted for approval in terms of section 46, subsection 4A of RECA. Furthermore, the committee urges the minister to prioritize the tabling of the legislation that overhauls RECA to address the identified constitutional defects and any other gaps that have arisen since the act was passed. I so move. Thank you. I will now recognize political parties wishing to make a declaration. The DA. Uh, thank you, Ask Chair. The DA agrees that this technology is needed and critical in the fight against organized crime. We do, however, live in a constitutional democracy where, amongst other things, citizens' privacy is protected by the Bill of Rights. The issue is not whether it is, this is needed, it is. The issue is that the Minister of Police in 2019 had SAPS purchase grabbers at the cost of 102 million rand illegally. We need to be mindful that to spend 102 million rand of taxpayers' money is not a quick and easy process so when it was stated in the portfolio committee meeting that the purchase took place unbeknown to senior officials was this ingenious. Those not familiar, familiar with what a grabber is, it's a device that can clone your phone, intercept your calls and SMSs, turn your phone into a transmitter to track your movements and eavesdrop on your conversations. If used legally, this is a very powerful tool in the fight against crime. SAPS, that is responsible to uphold the law, broke the law themselves. And according to historic events, this is not the first time or an isolated occurrence of this particular nature. In September 2015, Rights to Know submitted a prior request to SAPS and SSA to provide evidence that they were given permission by a judge to use these devices. All fire requests were denied. One can thus surmise that it was used illegally, so. As illegally obtained information can't be used as evidence in a court of law, what was it used for, against who and why? And now again, info that SAPS purchased these equipment in 2019 in contravention of the law. What is going on in SAPS? Why do they apply for a certificate of exemption only now? In an affidavit by Brigadier Iani Shumwani, the minister is directly implicated in this affair. Funnily enough, the brigadier was transferred out of crime intelligence after raising alarm about these illegal activities. I put attempted to investigate this unsuccessfully. These allegations were substantiated in Deputy National Commissioner Francina Buma's protected disclosure. And here we are. The ANC will probably use their majority, not in the best interest of the country, 
but to prevent or to cover for a comrade X post facto. When you say we promise we never use these devices and that the procurement thereof will be investigated, no one but yourselves believes you. South Africa was founded on the supremacy, supremacy of the constitution and the rule of law. This means that the constitution is the highest law of the land and no other law may conflict with it. Nor may the government do anything that violates it. That includes Minister Kele. No wonder crime in South Africa is out of control. When the people supposed to see to it that the law is not broken, breaks it themselves. One thing I'm sure of, nothing will be done about this under the ANC government. However, after 2024, accountability as a principle will stand central, which will see individuals being held to account. The DA supports this, but obviously with a pinch of salt. Can someone please turn him around? It's busy running down his neck. Thank you. Thank you. The EFF. <clears throat> Order. <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson. Chair, my, my time. Uh, Thank you. Chairperson, it is no secret that our country is riddled with crime to levels we cannot begin to fathom. The latest being the infamous and dangerous escape of Tabo Besta from prison, assisted by the state. This requires a state that is able to empower its law enforcement agencies to be able to detect communication that may render the security of the state and citizens vulnerable. The committee report wants us to approve that the certificate of exemption submitted for approval in terms of section 46, 4A of the regulation of interception of communication and provision of communication related information acts. This certificate will allow the South African police service to purchase and use equipment that is prohibited in terms of the act in order to investigate, combat and prevent serious crime. It was submitted that the intelligence service of the SAPS already designs, builds, and manufactures some categories of listed equipment. The problem we have with the certificate to SAPS by the Minister of Justice is that as it is, SAPS is saturated by officers who themselves are criminal. There is no clearly defined mechanism in the certificate for holding SAPS to account and vetting those who will come to possess and use this equipment. We know for a fact that SAPS is already using this equipment prohibited in the act to top track people, such as they did when the key decision makers at SAPS used this equipment to track those who robbed Mr. Ramaphosa's illicit dollars at Palapala Farm. What would stop SAPS from using this legal avenue to abuse its powers to not only illicitly monitor citizens, but to also use this to advance the political interests of those now in power? Until SAPS is fully professionalized and removed from the dirty stranglehold of equally dirty ministers, until it is free from criminal elements who now control it, the institution that is SAPS should not be granted the certificate to purchase and use this equipment. If we do permit them, we'll be granting the Kelsey Krant group of people powers to intrude on the privacy of citizens and of opposition political parties. So therefore the EFF rejects this report and pleads with us how to not grant the ACPS these powers. I thank you. Thank you. The IFP. Order members, order. Jobet Salab. The report before us seeks the approval of the National Assembly for a certificate of exemption 
which would exempt certain public bodies from the requirements to obtain a warrant before intercepting communications. Our duty and responsibility as legislators must always be guided by our apex law, the constitution, whose prescripts and rights as contained in the chapter Bill of Rights, such as the right to privacy in this case, must be carefully weighed against the limitation of such rights and in particular circumstances under which same can and should be limited, such as in the preventing and arresting criminal activity by our law enforcement agencies. In this day and age of the internet of things and the speed at which electronic communication takes place, effective communication surveillance is a tool that cannot be denied, but must in all circumstances be warranted and curtailed from any potential abuse by those who will such powers and carefully balanced against the fundamental right to privacy as is enshrined in our constitution. Checks and balances and all necessary safeguards must be in place to prevent such abuses from occurring and the interception of communications or communications surveillance must be strictly limited to the purposes for which they are authorized. Subject to the above concerns, the IFP supports the motivation for exemption by the Minister of Police, agreeing that same is in the public interest and necessary for our SAPS to investigate, combat, and prevent serious and criminal activities. The IFP supports the report and I thank you all chair. Thank you. The FF plus. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. You are muted. Uh, Honorable. Honorable House Chair, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Please proceed. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Um, Honorable House Chair, the Freedom Front Plus recognize the, the seriousness of this whole crime situation in South Africa and the possible necessity to gain in certain information. But Akbar, I have a few questions from me and that the South African government and our wet toepassing agents have not yet the necessary responsibility to discuss om zulke sensitieve inrichting te hanteer. Ons het onlangs gehoor dat die minister, die achtbare minister vir justitie en correctieve dienste op een vraag geantwoord het dat oor 37,000 cellfone in Suid-Afrikaanse tronke op beslag gelees en dat daar slechts 24 um, ambtenare daarvoor aangeplaas. Dit lijkt vir ons dat die die die, die misdaad intelligentie stelsels en die intel stelsels van die criminele wereld veel beter toegerus is as die van die Suid-Afrikaanse regering. En is die vrijheidsrondpis van mening dat het nie een goeie ding is dat die uh, regering toegang krijgt tot inlichting soos hierdie as hulle self nie verantwoordelik daarmee kan omgaan nie. Daarom ondersteun die VF Plus nie die verslag nie. Dankie voorzitter. Baie dankie. SCGP. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, today technology enables law enforcement agencies to not only electronically invade the intimate personal sphere of people's lives, but also to maintain and cement its presence there, continuously gathering, retaining, and where deemed necessary, using information to fight criminality who are becoming more and more sophisticated. Now, RICA is the primary legislation regulating the interception of communications, and it provides that such interception may only take place as long as it is in accordance with the provisions of the Act. And reportedly, the majority of RICA-related warrants are issued for investigations involving drug dealing, drug trafficking, 
vehicle theft and car hijacks, armed robberies, corruption and fraud, assassinations, murder, and terrorism. Now, the matter before the House today concerns the issue of a certificate of exemption, and the Minister of Police motivates the exemption on the basis that crime intelligence uses such listed equipment to investigate, combat, and prevent such serious crimes. Now, the ACDP appreciates that such equipment is necessary. However, at the same time, we are also fully aware of abuses that has been set out in various reports, including the Zonda report, uh, the United Nations Human Rights Committee indicated that the safeguards in RICO are insufficient to protect private rights of subjects. It said, the committee is concerned about the relatively low threshold for conducting surveillance in the state party and the relatively weak safeguards, oversight and remedies against unlawful interference with the right to privacy contained in RICO. Now, one of the safeguards is applications must be made to the designated interception judge. Now, it's interesting to hear what the designated interception judge in Kabindi has to say about the inadequacies of RICA. And in a 2021 report to Parliament, she stated that state authorities lie to get interceptions approved. And this is a shocking reality. She noted two cases in court processes where state agencies intercepted journalist communications and where police officials had fabricated and misrepresented information to the interception judge. And we now know that the RICA has been found by the Constitutional Court to be unconstitutional. So one has to weigh up the matters of public interest with these abuses. And we raised, the ACDP raised these concerns during the committee's deliberations on possible abuses and what safeguards are to be taken. And we appreciate the report has indicated that safeguards need to be improved. However, when one considers the increasing incidence and sophistication of criminal syndicates, then clearly those police officials that are doing the correct job in fighting crime and fighting the sophistication need to be supported. The ACDP will support this report. I thank you. Thank you. UDM. ATM. Good. House Chair, we support the certificate. Thank you. Thank you. NFP. Thank you, House Chairperson. The National Freedom Party will support the report table here today. Allow me, first of all, to raise the concern of, I think, the Constitutional Court, which found that the RICA Act was unconstitutional. But let us be honest, I think the fact that the levels of crime, particularly cybercrime, kidnapping, crime uh, 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 for ransom, is on the increase in South Africa. And the South African police services have been hampered by the lack of the necessary tools to be able to deal with this. And I'll give you one good example that when criminals kidnap somebody, they use a WhatsApp system. And our current system does not allow you to identify exactly where the calls are coming from and identify the location, which makes it very, very difficult for the South African police services and those attempting to combat crime to be able to effectively and timelessly uh, 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 find the, the, the actual area where this particular victim is being held. So I think to a very large extent, this in in intervention will assist the South African police services in dealing with crime. We know that cybercrime particularly is on the increase in South Africa. And having spoken to police officers recently, we found that they've had serious challenges in being able to, uh, 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 with the lack of capacity uh, uh, at the uh, level of uh, uh, cybercrime. And that's why they believe a lot of training and, 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 and uh, you know, from the international source needs to be introduced in South Africa and able to deal particularly with this aspect. But I think we must also be mindful of the fact that if 
not used in the correct manner, this can be open to abuse. There's no doubt about it. So I think some mechanisms needs to be put in place to ensure that police officers particularly will not abuse this facility that is now going to be available to them. But I think it is important to note that if you want police to fight crime, then you must give them the necessary tools. And this is one measure that you're putting in place that will go a long way to combat certain serious crimes that is on the increase in South Africa. The National Freedom Party supports this. Thank you. Thank you. The IEC. Thank you, the AIC, Chairperson. Thank you, Chairperson. The report of the Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services on the Certificate of Exemption tabled to the National Assembly for approval in terms of Section 46, Subsection 4A of the regulations of interception of communications and provisions of communications related information recommends that we approve the certificate of exemption tabled by the minister of justice there is however a slew of serious constitutional reservations we hold on this report it is perhaps convenient at this point to cite the relevant provisions of section 46 uh, subsection 6a and what it envisages section 46 4 a empowers the minister of justice if he has exempted any law enforcement agency from the prohibited acts of possess possessing and purchasing any equipment that is des is designed to intercept communications to table an exemption an, an exemption certificate before the assembly for approval. Shockingly, the concurrency of the NCOP is not in the act. If approved by the assembly, it will exempt the minister of police from the prohibited acts of possessing and purchasing any listed equipment. In simple terms, the minister of police will have a field day and can intercept any electronic communication, including intercepting direct communication. Honorable Chair, this is a sensitive area. It is sensitive because it implicates a slew of rights, particularly the right to privacy. The Constitutional Court has already declared some parts of the aforesaid legislation unconstitutional. While combating and detecting serious crimes is an important policing obligation. It must be done within the remit of constitution. The report of the committee readily acknowledges this and is clear that the minister must prioritize the tabling of legislation to, the, to remedy the defects of RECA as per the verdict of the constitutional court. What the committee doesn't say is that this exemption certificate must at least be vetted in our considered view by a panel of three judges before it is tabled in the assembly. We propose this route as the minister could be guided on how to frame the certificate so that there is no overreach or abuse by the minister of police. We therefore call for an un for accountability negating measure in this regard. This is because it, if left unchecked, this certificate could be used for other reasons without any Star form Wars, of accountability. Sure. Thank you. The call is a African Independent Congress. Thank you. Uh, the COPE, PAC, no declaration, Chair. Aljama. The ANC. Thank you, House Chair, Deputy President, the Chief Whip, members of the House. The African National Congress rises in support of the report of the Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services on the Certificate of Exemption submitted to the National Assembly for approval in terms of section 46 subsection 4A of the regulation of interception of communications and provision of communication related information act 2002, which is known as RICA. The right to privacy is an important constitutional right, which according to the constitutional court embraces the right to be free from intrusion 
and interference by the state and others in one's personal life. The right to privacy is protected in terms of both our common law and in section 14 of the constitution. The recognition and protection of the right to privacy as a fundamental human right in the constitution provides an indication of its importance. The constitutional right to privacy, like its common law counterpart, is not an absolute right, but may be limited in terms of law of general application and has to be balanced with other rights entrenched in the constitution. In protecting a, personal, a person's personal information, consideration should therefore also be given to competing interests such as the administering of national social programs, maintaining law and order, and protecting the rights, freedoms, and interests of others. The lack of balancing though these opposing interests is a delicate one. The regulation of interception of communications and provision of communication related information act is the result of an overhaul of the interception of monitoring prohibition act. Its adoption was informed by considerable technological developments in electronic communications, including cellular communications, satellite communications, and computer communications. House Chair, on the 15th of March, 2023, the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services submitted a certificate of exemption for approval by the National Assembly in terms of section 46, subsection 4A of RICA, in terms of section 45, subsection 1 of the Act. No person may manufacture, assemble, possess, sell, purchase, or advertise any listed equipment. Listed equipment is any equipment that is mainly designed to intercept communication that the minister declares as listed equipment by the notice, by notice in the Gazette. However, House Chair, Section 45, Subsection 2 of the Act provides for exemptions. The prohibition does not apply to any law enforcement agency which manufactures, assembles, possesses, sells, purchases, or advertises listed equipment under the authority of a certificate of exception issued for that purpose by the minister under Section 46 of the Act. In terms of Section 46, subsection 1A of the Act, the, minute, the minister may exempt any law enforcement agency from the prohibited acts of possessions and purchasing listed equipment on application and consultation with the cabinet, members responsible for communications, defense, intelligence services, and policing for such period and on such condition as the minister determines. The Minister of Justice and Correctional Services explained that the Minister of Police had applied for the for subs to be exempted from the prohibited acts of possessing, purchasing, manufacturing, and assembling of listed equipment referred to in section 45, subsection one. The Minister of Police motivated for an exemption on the basis that subs had applied to be exempted on three occasions. However, these applications were unsuccessful since approval of some of the relevant ministers could not be obtained. SAPS uses listed equipment to investigate, combat, and prevent serious crimes. The intelligence divisions of SAPS designs builds and manufactures some categories of listed equipment. Extensive controls are in place to regulate the use of listed equipment, and the exemption is in the public interest since the possession and use of listed equipment is necessary to investigate and combat and prevent serious criminal activities. House Chair, we greatly value and appreciate the right to privacy. We also appreciate the critical role that the, the interception of communication plays in securing our state, maintaining public order, and ensuring the safety of the Republic and its people. This is in line with our national development plan. House Chair, the ANC supports this report. I thank you. Uh, I will now recognize the Chief Whip of the Majority Party. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, I move for the adoption of the report. Thank you. Thank you. The motion is that the report be adopted. Are there any objections? House Chair, please note the objection of the other. Noted. Thank you. With that uh, objection of the FF plus, ma'am. Noted. 
With those objections, the report is thus agreed to. We will now ask the secretary to read the sixth and the seventh orders together. Consideration of report of portfolio committee on justice and correctional services on draft regulations for approval in terms of section 941 of legal practice act 2014 and consideration of report of portfolio committee on justice and correctional services on draft regulations for approval in terms of section 94.3 of legal practice act 2014. Thank you. May I now invite the Honorable Magwanisha to re, uh, introduce the report, Chairperson? Thank you very much, House Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, House Chairperson. Uh, the protocol observed. We would like to dedicate the passing of these regulations today to the women in the legal profession of our motherland. On Tuesday, the 25th of April, 2023, ceremonial court sittings in celebration of the 100 years of women in the legal profession in South Africa were held. After centuries of exclusion and marginalization, it was only through the Women's Legal Practice Act of 1923 that women were allowed to enter the legal profession. Prior to the act, women were not considered to be persons who could be admitted to legal practice. We celebrate great strides made towards the transformation and women representation in the profession. We now have women playing serious leadership roles, not only in the profession, but in the entire legal system of our country and the world. While much has been done, some much more still needs to be done for an equal society. The Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services, having considered regulations for approval in terms of section 94, subsection one of the Legal Practice Act of 2014 reports as follows. Section 91, subsection one C of the act provides that the minister must make regulations relating to amongst others, a procedure for the election of legal practitioners to the Legal Practice Council as contemplated in section seven, subsection one A of the act. Section seven of the act provides for the composition of the council and section seven, subsection one A provides for the council consisting of 16 legal practitioners elected in accordance with the procedure prescribed by the minister. Regulation two of the regulations provide for the election procedure referred in terms of section seven, subsection 1A of the act, but was drafted in limited timeframes and was focused on the first election that was held in 2018. The process was, was prescribed by regulations two is currently only paper-based. The proposed amendments are intended to ensure a smooth continuous transition from an existing council to another without overlap in administrative functions, confusion and duplications of elected members. Provision is also made for the option of electronic voting. The proposed amendments do not change the structure or policy of regulation two. Section 94, subsection 1J of the act provides for regulations regarding the rendering of community service as contemplated in section 20, 29, subsection one of the act. Section 29, subsection one of the act provides that the minister must, after consultation with the Legal Practice Council, prescribe the requirements for community service. These requirements may include community service as a component of practical vocational training by candidate legal practitioners or a minimum period of recurring community service by practice and legal practitioners upon which continued enrollment as a legal practitioner is dependent. No regulations have been made as yet regarding community service. The proposed regulations provide for the rendering of community service by candidate legal practitioners who must undertake eight hours per annum 
of community service and by legal practitioners who must render 40 hours per annum of community service. The committee recommends that the National Assembly approve the draft regulations submitted in terms of section 94 and in terms of section 93 uh, of the Legal Practice Act. I thank you. May I now recognize parties wishing to make declarations, the DA? Thank you, House Chair. We rise in support of these, re uh, these reports and the regulations made by the Minister. House Chair, the, the legal prof profession has its roots and is steeped in a tradition, firstly, of service. It is and is supposed to be a vocation in which legal practitioners, uh, specifically in a constitutional democracy like ourselves, must assist other role players and stakeholders in the justice system to deliver justice. Um, in that sense, the legal profession has uh, always been earmarked by some um, in their ranks who have a, 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 a view that they are to serve the community firstly, and therefore pro bono services is nothing new in the South African legal tradition. These regulations will now formalize an obligation on legal practitioners to render pro bono and community services. It's the product of a lengthy consultation process between the minister and the council. And while we appreciate that this first iteration of the obligation to perform community and pro bono services must err on the side of caution, and not overburden specifically legal practitioners who practice in smaller firms and in rural, rural areas in setups characterized by smaller profits, mar, profit margins and lower fee structures. The reality is that the, the regulations are unfortunately vague to the point where in our, if they are to be assessed in a few years time, in our view, it will in, invariably have very little impact. But it's a starting point and our hope is that these regulations will enable candidate practitioners and practitioners to look with fresh eyes at community service and pro bono work in matters of broad public interest and benefit. Chair, it remains a concern that the act for some other reason has identified work for the South African Human Rights Commission as community service while work at other chapter nine institutions like the Public Protector, the Commission, for gender equality and chapter 10 institutions like the Independent Electoral Commission and their Auditor General, along with work possibly for the Special Investigative Unit and the National Prosecuting Authority, needs to be approved by the Minister before it will qualify. The other set of regulations under discuss discussion dealing with the composition and continuity at the Legal Practice Council is also support. However, we need to express our concern that this set of regulations was seemingly settled on in 2021 already and were, was then delayed for what's called technical reasons. Our hope is that these regulations and the completion of the government governance framework for the Legal Practice Council will enable the type of governance that will bolster and nurture public confidence in the council and the legal profession as a whole. Perceptions around biased and slow disciplinary processes uh, when, it, when the council deals with its own must be addressed urgently in order to ensure that the profession as a whole is held in the, in the type of regard that befits a key player in the justice and criminal justice system. Thank you. Thank you. The EFF. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, the first regulation that we need to approve here relates to Section 29 of the Legal Practice Act, which requires the Minister to pass regulations in relation to the community service that candidate legal practitioners and legal practitioners need to render. The Minister has therefore made these regulations, which should require candidate legal practitioners to render eight hours of community service per year, while requiring admitted legal practitioners to render 40 hours per year. We welcome these regulations as they will make the law more accessible to ordinary citizens who would otherwise not afford 
to have legal services available to them. The second regulation the minister makes relates to section 94 of the act, which deals with election procedures of the Legal Practice Council. These regulations will make it easy to transition from one elected LPC structure to another and provides no fundamental changes to the practice as currently implemented. The EFF is also in support of this relation too. We would however like to caution the minister and the Legal Practice Council to tread carefully in enforcing these regulations on emerging black legal practitioners. The legal field is already stacked with interests that are inimical to the growth and development of black practitioners. Black lawyers are not given briefs that enable them to expand their practices and make a living from law. Perhaps the next legislative intervention needed should be to have a prescribed percentage of cases by the state to be handled by black lawyers. However, we do encourage black lawyers to offer their skills and services to black communities in particular, particularly cases that relate to drafting of wills and administrative of states. There are thousands of estates and villages and townships that were never administered at all after the death of parents. These lead to complications later on when siblings and family members fight. These areas and cases of eviction of farm workers and farm dwellers by racist farmers need urgent attention of progressive lawyers. So therefore, Chairperson, we are in support of all these regulations. Thank you. Thank you. The IFP. A functional legal practice council and governing body, as well as the rights of all citizens in the country of access to justice, are of paramount import to our legal system, which must operate in a just and fair manner. The LPC serves as the regulatory body for the legal profession in the country and is tasked with ensuring that all legal practitioners maintain the highest standards of professionalism and ethics. In first draft regulation, which is regulation two, deals with transitional administrative arrangements in order to ensure a seamless transition uh, from an existing- professor. Professor, I didn't want to intervene when you were assisted by Mr. Lengwa that time. Uh, so I thought it is off now. Okay. No, the time has been stopped. Don't worry, Mr. Lengwa. Okay. <laughs> Proceed, uh, Honorable. The first draft regulation deals with transitional administrative administrative in order to ensure a seamless transition from existing council to another. Without undue overlap or bureaucracy and other technical ICT improvements, such as the option of electronic voting procedures. The second draft regulation deals with the rendering of community service to candidate legal practitioners in accordance with section 29.1. Order the members. Which provides that the minister must after consultation with the Legal Practice Council prescribe the requirements for community service. Such requirements include community service as a component of practical vocational training by candidates legal practitioners, or a minimum period of recurring community service by practicing legal practitioners upon which continued enrollment as a legal practitioner is dependent. Through this draft, the regulation provision will be made for the rendering of community service by candidate legal practitioners who must undertake eight hours per annum for community service and by practicing legal practitioners who must render 40 hours per annum a community service. Both regulations 
are necessary and will promote greater public confidence in the legal profession and our justice system. The legal profession under the control of Legal Practice Council must be effective and its enrolled professionals accessible and accountable. The IFP supports both reports. I thank you, House Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> FF Plus. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. The Freedom Front Plus rise to support both the amendments on both regulations. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Thank you. ACDP. UDM. Thank you, House Chair. The ACDP supports these two reports. The first one relates to uh, proposed amendments on the voting of the new council and to ensure a smooth, continuous transition from the existing council to the new council. And the second relates to requirements for community service. And other speakers have alluded to this need, but there's an insightful article written by Professor Kasim and a legal practitioner, Mohammed, about the need for law students to become involved in legal aid clinics and street law programs. And there are several benefits also for law students to participate in such programs. The students then uh, understand practicalities of everyday law, how to apply the law, and they become aware of legal issues within South Africa. And most importantly, those students are given exposure to the communities in which they work, operate, study, and they gain firsthand experience of the needs of such communities engagement with the communities and in particular disadvantaged communities and vulnerable members of society inculcates those students with the importance of value of using their newly found legal knowledge and skills to give back to the communities. And unless students work amongst their communities, they will not be able to fully understand and assist them. And I also worked in, in street law programs when I studied and I found it very beneficial. This exposure will play a, an important role in preparing law students for community service work to be undertaken by them when there are candidate legal practitioners and, of course, practicing legal practitioners as referred to in the regulations. So as there are no present regulations setting out community service for candidate legal practitioners and legal practitioners, the ACDP supports these regulations, but would also implore universities to apply similar principles for law students. I thank you. Thank you. The UDM? ATM? Good. House Chair, we support the reports and the regulations. Thank you. Thank you. NFP? Okay. Uh, AIC? We support the report of regulations, Honorable Chairman. Thank you. COPE, PAC. PAC is our board chair. Thank you. Al Jama, ANC. House chair, members of the house. His Excellency, the Deputy President in absentia. Uh, Chairperson, while the women in this fraternity, women lawyers, appreciate and thank the African National Congress for enhancement of uh, their contribution and participation in the legal uh, fraternity. Chair, however, more still have to be done on matters and many issues, including matters of briefing. Chair, the African National Congress rises in support of the report on the draft regulation made in terms of Section 94.1 and 3, Legal Practice Act 2014. A few days ago, on the 27th of April 20, 2023,
the country celebrated 29 years of freedom and democracy. The democratic dispensation brought about paradigm shift from the old apartheid order to a legal and constitutional order. In the midst of the legal order that affords equal rights to all, the lived experience of ordinary South Africans is still of grave concern. The triple challenges of poverty and unemployment, unemployment and inequality continue to exist. Section 34 of the Constitution guarantees everyone the right to have any dispute that can be resolved by the application of law decided in the fair public hearing before a court or where appropriate another independent and impartial tribunal or forum. When we speak of justice and the access to it, legal representation is a criti critical component. It is common cause that many South Africans cannot afford to pay for their legal representation, given the disparities in our society. The late former Chief Justice Arthur Chekelson articulated his vision for community service to be introduced to all law graduates in order to improve access to justice. Parliament passed the Legal Practice Act of 2014 <laughs> Among others, the Legal Practice Act aims to transform the legal system in South Africa and broaden access to justice for many South Africans. Section 29 of the Legal Practice Act provides for the rendering of community service by candidate legal practitioners and practice legal practitioners. Section 941J of the Act provides for regulations regarding the rendering of community service as contemplated in section 29.1 of the act. Section 29.1 of the act provides that the minister must, after consult consultation with the Legal Practice Council, prescri prescribe the requirements for community savers. These requirements may include community savers as a component of practical vocational training by candidate legal practitioners or a minimum period of recurring community service by practicing legal practitioners upon which continued en enrollment as a legal practitioner is uh, dependent. The proposed regulations provide for the rendering of community service by candidate legal practitioners who must undertake eight hours per annum community savers and by practical legal practitioners who must render 40 hours per annum community savers. Section 941C of the Act provides that the minister must make regulations relating to, among others, a procedure for the election of legal practitioners to the Legal Practice Council, as contemplated in Section 71A of the Act. We believe that compliance by all legal practitioners with a mandatory number of hours of community savers will assist in addressing the, admit, the ad, un, unmet demand for free legal services for vulnerable and indigent persons. The implementation of a system of community savers by legal practitioners will result in the increased provision of legal advice and representation for the poor and the missing middle who cannot afford the fees charged by lawyers. The ANC supports, I thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Honorable members, I will put the two orders for approval separately. Are there any objections to the approval of the draft regulation in terms of section 941? of Legal Practice Act 2014, as it appears on the order paper. No objection agreed to. Are there any objections to the approval of the draft regulations in terms of section 943 of Legal Practice Act 2014, as it appears on the order paper? No objection 
agreed to. I will now ask the secretary to read the eighth order. Consideration of legislative proposal to amend National Small Enterprise Act 1998. Thank you. May I now now the Honorable Siwela? Yes. Honorable of the committee to thank you, Honorable House Chair. Oh, thank you, Honorable House Chair. Honorable House Chair, esteemed members of the House, members of the Portfolio Committee, it gives me great pleasure to stand before you today to introduce the proposed amendments to the National Small Enterprise Act of 1996 in accordance with Rule 273 of the Rules of the National Assembly. Honorable members, the Constitution remains our guiding compass in this regard. It specifies the legislative procedures that each bill must follow in order to be approved by Parliament. House Chair, after listening carefully to the concerns of the small enterprise sector, we are adamant that this is the journey this committee must pursue in an effort to better the lives of our people. Persuade to the memorandum to the House that this committee anonymously endorsed. I come before you today, not only in my capacity as chairperson of the committee, but on behalf of the many millions of small businesses around the country that are pleading for justice in the face of an increasingly antagonistic environment. Notwithstanding the extraordinary contribution of this sector in many emerging economics, the failure rate of the small enterprise sector in South Africa is alarmingly high. House Chair, Today, we embark on the next step in our collective efforts of putting the small enterprise sector at the heart of this economy. For the past five years, we have noted the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor report in which shows that South Africa has one of the lowest total entrepreneurial activity rate compared to her peers. This has to be resolved. After a devastating economy, Castor catastrophe four brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic in the Small Enterprise Development Agency first quarterly report of 2021 indicated that the number of SMEs in South Africa declined by 11% from 2.61 million to 2.33 million in 2021 quarter one. This is a huge loss that will take years to recover from. Unlike other emerging economics, which are exhibiting signs of recovery, the South African economy is struggling to recuperate from the shattering impacts of the pandemic. The medium term projections made by the South African Reserve Bank recently with the gross domestic product expected to grow by 0.7% in 2024, down from the initial forecast of 1.4% signals an economy that is under a lot of pressure. In view of the current scenario, we are called house chair to step up our efforts to radically reform our country's economy, the right condition must be established. The committee's decision to call for a, the National Small Enterprise Act reform is by no means a magic bullet. However, the committee is now in a stronger position than it was when it first called for an amendment to the act because of the advantages of having engaged with the sector extens extensively since from the fifth parliament. We are therefore pleased to see this hugely important process taking shape. <clears throat> Planting a seed we can all be proud of. Small enterprises are grappling with plethora of issues that have nothing to do with their businesses. Increasing levels of frustration and impatience are there that time is of the essence. Failure to act will threaten democratic gains. South Africa has to specifically pinpoint measures to quickly lower the alarmingly high youth unemployment rates and to provide young people with more opportunities. The sector remains the low hanging fruit to tackle massive youth unemployment. 
we must for all intents and purposes re-engineize the small enterprise sector to deal to lead economic revolution of this country we need to build on this momentum as we approach the seventh parliament and continue the efforts made in previous ones to prioritize our objectives as stated in the ndp house chair we are the lawmakers the constitutional authority is vested in us, the parliament. Where policy, regulatory, or legislative gaps are discovered, we are required by constitution to take action. This committee, in accordance with Rule 551B, is pleading with the National Assembly to mobilize its authority and give it permission to streamline the National Small Enterprise Act in order to be responsive to the modern days, day issues. For the purpose of the this submission, I do not intend to reiterate the memorandum submitted to the House. However, I feel it is necessary that I touch on the key <coughs> objectives of the bill. The main objective of the bill is to make sure that separate in a favorable and pleasant environment. I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I recognize parties wishing to make a declaration, the DA. House Chair, small, medium, and micro enterprises and cooperatives form a vital comp component of the South African economy. From street workers to small factories represent the lifeblood of our economic landscape. Small business entrepreneurs constitute the heart of the economic uh, environment. However, this businesses often face substantial challenges with dealing with government regulations and larger businesses. The playing field between small and big business is uneven and small businesses struggle to operate on the same level as large corporations, which often exercise their financial muscle to bully small businesses. The Department of Small Business Development has been painfully slow in tabling new legislation, providing the much needed support for SMMEs to thrive and prosper. Their lack, the, the lack of urgency is unacceptable. They, their continued inaction has severely hindered the growth and development of small businesses in South Africa. One key component is ensuring that SMMEs are paid swiftly and on time by government and big businesses. The DA refuses to stand idly by while the department consistently fails to deliver on its mandate, leaving small businesses to suffer the consequences. The Portfolio Committee of Small Business Development in response to the absence of legislation, had to perform the function of an ombud over the past nine years. We are, we are flooded with complaints from small businesses owners who have nowhere else to turn, demonstrating the urgency for better legislative support. The introduction of the committee bill presents sustainable proposals and solutions to address the challenges of small businesses. The amendment of the National Small Enterprise Act aims to establish an enterprise commission and tribunal. This will provide small business owners with relief from constant elbowing they endure from red tape and greedy big business. Small businesses suffer in silence. They are either go underground or fading, just fading away. It's clear that the lack of legislation, regulation, the relationship between big business, small business and government red tape poses a challenge, demanding the creation of an independent legislative body to help heal SMEs suffering. The proposed amendments aim to establish the Small Business Commission and the Tribunal 
which will offer benefits for the community. Else. You know, to their expectation. You know, get tired. You know, do the best. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Uh, no, this one, no. Thank you, Chair. First, I will provide a low cost and accessible alternative to the traditional legal system for resolving disputes, particularly beneficiary for SMMEs who cannot afford high legal fees or lengthy legal proceedings. Second, they will level the playing fields for SMMEs promoting fair competition between larger and smaller businesses. Finally, they will foster economic growth and job creation, helping to create a more supportive and con conducive environment for SMMEs to thrive. The DA supports the common committee's intervention to introduce an amendment to the National Small Enterprise Act and urge the Minister of Small Business Development to act decisively and swiftly. It's time to work together to ensure a brighter future for SMMEs across South Africa. And this bill serves a critical step towards achieving this goal. We support this um, motion. Thank you. The EFF. The EFF. Uh, thank you, Chair. Greetings to the Commander-in-Chief of the EFF, Commissars and Fighters. Chairperson, the report before the Committee from the Portfolio Committee of Small Business Development seeks to amend the National Small Enterprise Act. We welcome the initiative by the committee members to introduce legislation. It remains a concern that a parliament we have failed in the fifth and the sixth term of to build sufficient capacity to support members of the parliament and committees in introducing legislation. So this is a positive development and we support the committee's request. However, we are of the view that while the amendment focus on the establishment of the Small Enterprise Commission and the Small Enterprise Appeals Tribunal. Many of the challenges that SMMEs face are a result of the collapse of the state. There is no political will to strategically locate SMMEs as drivers and the creators of employment and livelihoods for millions who can find and who cannot find employment and are excluded from participating in the economy. SMMEs do not find expression in any of industrial localization strategies. This is made worse by the fact that the country does not have an industrial and a localization strategy. Many of the bodies and entities that are being created under Mr. Sere Ramaphosa are poorly designed, do not have a clear mandate, and it has become a way to avoid making tough decisions. We will debate the matter in the committee after we have engaged in the public consultation process, but we do not believe a committee will resolve the limbo SMMEs find themselves in. The existing institutions, including institutions such as the Competition Commission, BEE Commission, and others, must address challenges facing SMMEs together with all development finance institutions responsible for financing and supporting SMMEs to resolve issues of delays in processing applications, non-payment of SMMEs, and poor communication by the government broadly. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. IFP.
Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Chairperson, the Honorable Inkosi Lutuli serves on this committee, but is indisposed. But the IFP position on this matter is as follows. Small, micro, and medium enterprises are the backbone and drivers of inclusive economic growth and development in South Africa. These businesses play a critical part in contributing to the economy, accounting to 34% of South Africa's gross domestic product. This sector is often regarded as one of the solutions towards alleviating some economic challenges such as poverty and the high unemployment rate. However, for small, micro and medium enterprises to reach their full potential and advance beyond South Africa's high startup failure rate of about 70 to 80% for small businesses in the first five years, we need to discuss and address the key challenges they face. One big challenge is the burdensome regulations SMMEs are often subject to. The practice of extending wage agreements that is above the minimum wage in bargaining councils where small businesses have little to no representation places them at a disadvantage as they cannot afford higher wages decided on by their larger counterparts. Therefore, the creation of a small enterprise commission whose function is to regularly engage and maintain relations with regulatory bodies and also report the requirements of SMMEs will afford them a voice and a platform on bargaining councils. A further challenge SMEs face is the impact of South Africa's tender system, where they have to compete with big businesses on tenders. However, these businesses often have well-established networks which affords them better chances of being selected for tenders and contracts. Therefore, the creation of a small enterprise appeals tribunal with powers to improve the operating environment, issue sanctions against unscrupulous businesses, penalize unethical behavior, and investigate unfair terms of trade will provide SMMEs with a platform to air grievances that otherwise would have been left unaddressed. Honorable Chairperson, colleagues, we must recognize that small and medium-sized enterprises stimulate competition for the design of products, prices, and efficiency. Without SMEs, large enterprises would hold a monopoly in almost all the activity areas, and this is something we must not allow to happen. We must also look at ways of providing easier access to finance for SMMEs for them to be able to thrive in our economic environment. And if some of them cannot pay what they borrow, then so be it. We must be prepared to take our risks, because I think in 90% of the time, they will pay what they have received. The IFP accepts the support. Thank you. Thank you. VFF Plus. Thank you, our chairperson. Our chair, SMMEs are crucial to economic growth and economic development in South Africa. Without SMMEs, we will lose a lot of employment opportunities. But Chairperson, the regulatory environment in South Africa makes it extremely difficult for especially small businesses and entrepreneurs to actually create employment. This suggested proposal on legislation and especially the tribunal with regards to disputes is extremely important and the FF Plus supports this motion and the report. I thank you. Thank you. ACGP? You can it said. The ACDP supports the motion. Thank you very much. Okay. ACGP? Uh, yes, UDM. The ACDP supports motion. Thank you. Sorry, UDM. ATM. Good. House Chair, we're in support. Thank you. Thank you. NFP. Thank you, House Chairperson. In supporting this, the National Freedom Party want to raise a few points. First of all, I think we all know that small enterprises or small businesses is paramount for economic growth in a country and is the highest cause of job creation in the country. However, the stringent conditions under which many of these small businesses have to operate results in their failure. But over and above that, we do know and understand that small business, particularly development, provides funding to them. But I think what is lacking, uh, Chairperson, is the understanding amongst many small enterprises 
of business itself. There is a major difference between being a plumber and owning a plumbing business. And what we often find is this, that while funding is provided to small enterprises, what we do not provide for them is financial management, human resource development. If you do not provide them with this expertise and skills, you find often that small businesses tend to close. But the other problem that we have, Chairperson, is the amount of red tape that exists for small businesses to access funding and things. Very, very difficult. What banks often ask for is if they did have that, then they obviously didn't need the banks in the first place. So I think in supporting this, we need to be mindful of that. But very importantly, you know, South Africa's uh, uh, for small business, the environment is not conducive. And let me tell you why. Foreign nationals in South Africa, their businesses are thriving. I can tell you nine out of 10 of them don't pay no taxes. They're not accountable to SARS and things. So the competition is so stiff that local businesses cannot survive. But I think we need to do a lot more in that. The National Freedom Party supports us. Thank you very much. Thank you. AIC. Thank you, sir. The proposed National Small Enterprise Bill contains a raft of proposals to be considered by the House. They range from the provisions dealing with dispute resolution, such as supply contractor disputes, including provisions dealing with development of code of practice by industry and those dealing with mediation of complaints made by or on behalf of SMMEs. There is a separate proposal in the bill for the establishment of a small enterprise appeals tribunal to adjudicate and mediate on matters referred to, to it or by any aggrieved party. All these legislative proposals are informed by the non-payment of service rendered, including late payment, Allegations of corporate bullying, abuse of dominance, price discrimination, unfair terms of trade, red tape, and unfair competitive conduct by big firms have also informed these legisl legislative proposals. It cannot be gainsaid that small businesses are at the center of injecting massive employment opportunities of our people. To deny businesses their competitive edge and cost advantage is to tinker with the very prospects of creating sustainable jobs. SMMEs are the pulse of our creative spirit. An enabling environment must be therefore exist to shield small businesses from unfair competitive practices. On our return, we propose that the bill must have pro provisions on an independent agency to work towards the development of a thriving SME market through fostering an intelli intelligent risk-based profiling system to monitor abuse of dominance and late pay payment, amongst others. This agency must work in line with competition commission. The agency will further implement an accreditation, accreditation framework which separates compliant from non-compliant organs of state. We are further of the view that these agents must be tasked with prioritizing engagement with relevant stakeholders, both domestic and regional. The aim of these engagements must deal with constraints that impede SME, SMMEs development and funding. We will offer these inputs, Honorable Chair, should we get the invitation from the committee. We support the bill, Honorable Chair. Thank you. PAC, I mean, co? PAC? PAC supports, Chair. Thank you. Aljama? ANC? Honorable House Chair, Honorable Members, the Portfolio Committee on Small Business Development is presenting before the National Assembly the report of the Portfolio Committee on Legislative Proposal to amend the National Small Enterprise Act 1998, Act of 102 of 1996. 
This amendment is critical to the smooth functioning and development of the small business sector as part of the process of economic transformation. Government has invested considerable effort and financial resources in the development of small, medium, and micro enterprise. These enterprises are located in local areas and make a significant contribution to microeconomy through value-added activities. More importantly, SMMEs make a significant contribution to GDP and job creation and employment and employment is almost 60% of those employed are in the SME sector. Furthermore, the contribution made SMMEs to, to, to fiscals does not go unnoticed, and it is significant contribution, which is currently constantly improving. In turn, government support for the development of this sector, integral to economic transformation, and inclusive economic development. Government investment in the sector through CIFA and other financial mechanisms to ensure the survival and further development of the sector is important for the growth and development of this sector. The development of small business development within the framework of microeconomic development localization is integral to the implementation of the economic recovery and reconstruction plan. It is also critical. Is it is also critical that there is further legislative regulatory support for the small business sector, and this is basis of this legislative intervention through National Small Enterprise Amendment Bill, 2023. The bill seek to create the Small Enterprise Commission, which seek to advance the interest and development of the sector. The commission will process complaints which are received regarding their dealings with other business and government agencies. This will also be important in relation to barriers of entry, ensuring empowerment of small business sector to ensure inclusive economic growth development in microeconomy. The small business commission must investigate complaints by small business and if need, refer the result of the investigation to the bodies tasked with the resolution of such complaint. This means coordinated approach between the Small Business Commission and other bodies of the resolution of critical issues which affect the sector. The development of industri industrial parks and agro-processing zones means that in order for small business to, to thrive, they will require provision of service asset to market, and even the same, the small business can assist the development of the sector. However, the basis upon which the legislative amendment arose in that committee received a number of complaints from SMEs about the market condition, which negatively impact on the progress of SMEs operating in the market. Complaints include, among others, non-payment or late payment for service rendered and goods supplied, product delivered Contractual disputes were source of concern, as well as unco uncompetitive behavior by these big businesses, which are aimed at driving small business out of operating in the market. The non-payment or late payment of small business creates severe working capital constraints for small business and constrain their development, or at times the right insolvency. For small businesses, contractual dispute through the legal process is time consuming, costly, which small business cannot afford. Therefore, it is important that small business assisted timelessly in resolution of problem. The report is clear that the issue being raised, this have been previously raised in fifth parliament, but legislation was not developed due to overlap between what departments was doing and proposed legislation. However, the issue remains the same, and therefore it is time legislation is developed to create small business commission and appeals tribunal as small business sector is poised for development as part of the DTM model and economic reconstruction and recovery plan. It is projected that by 2030, 
the sector will create some 11 million jobs, therefore must be assisted to develop to that target level of employment. Therefore, it is imperative that small business sector be assisted through legislation amendment, which allows for creation of small business commission and the appeals to tribunal, which must be legally empowered, efficient resolve the problem which arise in the sector. A people's parliament must take up the issue of the people and provide solution to the problem which different sectors face. Why the portfolio committee is not empowered to take up the up, resolve the specific problem raised by small business sector, it can certainly seek the support of the National Assembly and NSOP to support legislative change, which allow for the resolution of this critical issue. The speed and efficient resolution of complaint by small business will allow for the growth and development of the sector. The ANC support the legislative proposal to amend the National Small Enterprise Act 1998, Act 102 of 1996, geared towards the creation of Small Business Commission. We hope that National Assembly consider the report and adopt reports as well as support the portfolio committee in the development and passing of the amendment to the, to the National Small Enterprise Act. I thank you, House Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sweepy went long and we could censor. Mandibule, Shalo, and Pagamisa into Yoba. Then, your king, Louis and Pet. I am Kelly and Gus. So was them for Nisha. The motion is that permission be given to the portfolio committee on small business development to proceed with the legislative proposal. Are there any objections? No objections agreed to. The secretary will read the last order of the day. Debate on Freedom Day, consolidating and safeguarding democratic gains. I will call the Honorable Hermans to introduce the report. Thank you, House Chair. I greet the Chief Whip and the Deputy Chief Whip of the Majority Party leading this formidable force of the African National Congress in Parliament. Let me start by quoting the wise words of Nelson Mandela, who wrote in his book, The Long Walk to Freedom, that I quote, the truth is that we are not yet free. We have merely achieved the freedom to be free. We have not taken the final step of our journey, but the first step on a longer and even more difficult road. For to be free is not merely to, be, to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others, close quote. Today, we are celebrating the heroic struggles waged by gallant men and women who understood that freedom could not be given to them as a gift. They knew it had to be relentless, relentlessly fought for and achieved. Today, we also pay tribute to our heroes who passed away during this, the month of April such as the former president, Oliver Tambo, Chris Hani, and Solomon Mahlangu. Their lives and untold sacrifices remind us that our freedom was not free and that it came at a great cost, including life itself. We also think of the people of South Africa who suffered in various ways during the apartheid era and before. 
Many were brutally murdered, imprisoned, and tortured. Millions of our people suffered immense poverty and deprivation through the system of institutionalized racism, which rendered black people to be trespassers in the land of their birth and not worthy of any rights. Thousands were dehumanized in various ways. It was painful. It was a painful and cruel system, which was correctly described as a crime against humanity by the United Nations. The victory of our people in 1994 through selfless struggle, assisted by freedom-loving people across the world, ended the centuries-long national oppression, which was coupled with repression. It set our nation on a path towards reconciliation, freedom, justice, peace, democracy, equality, and indeed an entrenched strong culture of fundamental human rights and liberties. The African National Congress had since its inception envisioned a society that is non-racial, non-sexist, united and prosperous. All policy imp implements of the ANC-led government has uh, the ANC-led government has introduced since 1994 are designed to achieve that vision of a better life for all, especially the poor and the working class. Bayer-Gemeenskappen in huishoudens was zonder elektriciteit, water, fire, en klinieke waar hulle goeie gezondheidsdienste geniet het in school was a hoer standard and half. The Democratic regering had said that in 1994, every year, hier die basis of hier die, hier die basis dienste gelewe. Millions of us people geniet now this toegang to hierdie dienste. More than a million, than nine million children attend no free schools, no fee schools. About nine million children are also provided with free meals at school so that, no, so that hunger does not impair their concentration in class. For some, this is the only decent meal of the day given the circumstances at home. And these circumstances of parents should not handicap a child's future. More than 18 million are benefiting from a range of social grants, up to 3 million, up from 3 million in 1994. Over 8 million new households, household electricity connections have been made since 1996. Uh, to put this in context, in the preceding century, successive white minority regimes only, erectif uh, only electrified 5 million households. In excess of 3.3 .3 million houses have been built, benef benefiting more than 16 million piece, uh, people. The ANC-led government is working hard to upgrade all informal settlements around the country. We are no longer just building houses. We are building human settlements. We have much to celebrate. It goes without saying that the working class and the poor have been uh, great beneficiaries of our freedom and democracy. We therefore have a, the collective responsibility to defend our democratic gains as South Africa with the same vigor as when we fought for it. We must unite and not allow anything to threaten the freedom and democracy we had fought so hard for. Notwithstanding all these socioeconomic, uh, notwithstanding Notwithstanding all of these great socioeconomic redistribution advance, advances, our economy has witnessed insufficient structural transformation, particularly of the systemic features of our productive economy. As a consequence, we have a crisis, we have crisis levels of poverty, unemployment and inequality, which, contrib which continue to be reproduced mainly driven by high levels of concentration in the economy, 
a financial banking sector that has not adequately reinvested in the productive sectors of the economy. Stark uh, spatial inequalities between urban and rural areas. It is for this reason that the ANC government prioritizes progressive transformative policies such as triple BE and preferential procurement, which contribute in including black people in the mainstream economy. The annual status, the national status and trends of triple BE transformation report 2021 reported that the percentage of black South Africans holding a directorship decreased from 57 to, uh, in 2020 to 51.6 in 2021, whereas uh, a holding of um, black directorships in JSE listed entities has increased uh, to 28%. Our, affirm our, affirmative, our infirm affirmative action policies have widened access for Black people to pursue any field of work. These are but some of the gains thank you very of much. our freedom. I, I thank you, Chair. The next speaker is the Honorable El Kakao from the DA. Thank you, House Chairperson. The ANC has blown any and every right to call itself a liberation movement. I dare say there is nothing positively massive and liberating about your legacy. See, freedom under the ANC's leadership and government means a lost dream, an illusion of success, a perpetual accumulation of whoopsies and quite frankly, a gangsters disguised as liberation messiahs parade. Nete kohore masha shela rona haa waka 1994. Instead, all that changed is the key holders of the shackles of our lives. Chair, there is no freedom in a land where children suffer and die of malnutrition and in pit toilets where students have to perform their poverty and desperation every year for access to tertiary education. Where seven out of 10 young people wake up every day to a distant dream of ever finding a job in order to put food on the table. There is no freedom in being born in a rural town such as Jachasfontein and all the other eight towns of the Kopanung local municipality in the free state, where access to an uninterrupted supply to clean and drinkable water has been an everyday pipe dream for the last eight years, simply because no one knows where the money budgeted for water supply and the provision of practically every other service went. Chair, there is no freedom in a land where patients die in their homes waiting for unavailable ambulances and in hospital corridors praying for a bed allocation or a mere glance by a nurse, never mind a doctor. There is no freedom in a land where being assaulted, raped, and murdered with little to no protection for victims by the police, the correctional service, and our judicial system has become a norm. Chair, there is no freedom in a land that cultivates the tabobesters of this world. There is no freedom in a land where corruption, crime, load shedding, the unbearable cost of living, and our failing economy have become ordinary conversation appetizers. See, the bottom line is that not only is the ANC abusive to all of us, but its haters and self-righteous appointees are across cabinets in all three spheres of government, it has broken its vows to serve and protect South Africa. 
It no longer even tries to hide its lack of respect for the 60 million residents of this country who have done nothing but ask for a caring, competent and decent government. And so your calls for the celebration of Freedom Month is not only a spit in the faces of the residents of this country, but a spit on the faith on the graves of all those who lost their lives fighting for our democracy. And so there is no freedom in South Africa, our land. Thank you, Honorable Member. The Honorable Sanguine. Thanks very much, House Chair. Greetings to the Commander-in-Chief and to all ground forces of the EFF. Let me say to you, hashtag EFF is turning 10 this year. Chair, the theme of this debate is so removed from the reality of Black people's life, lived experience since 1994. There is absolutely nothing worth talking about that the ruling elite has done for the millions of disposed, oppressed and exploited black people in this country. The ruling elite merely replaced a white minority oppressive regime with a black majority oppressive regime. When the ANC took over political power in 1994, Unemployment rate in this country was 20%, and today it's over 40%. Of people working age, 40% of the people of the working age are unemployed in this country. Since the Black representatives of capital took over political power in 1994, they have had and continuously have no clue to historically responsibly form the liberation movement to, to chart a progressive political path for the majority of our people. Over the past two decades of the country, we have experienced an explosion of crime such as murder in this country resembled and are sometimes worse than those of the war taught countries. For the past five years, police crime statistics have consistently re reported murder rate averaging 7,000 murders every single quarter. That means that 28,000 people are murdered in this country every single year. And that the majority of those who commit those murders do it with impunity. Knowing that this will never be caught, they will never be caught, those in power have systematically destroyed the capacity of the police system to prevent to investigate these crimes. In this country, 50,000 women are raped and sexually assaulted every year. And that number represents only the cases that are reported. There are 1,000 more rape cases that goes unreported and never see the light of day at a police station. What sort of freedom is this that needs consolidation of safeguarding thereof? Is it a freedom of a tiny minority to continue benefiting from the resources of this country while the majority still suffer. Today, 28 years later, and after attainment of political freedom, the ruling elite has done nothing but noticeably, the noticeable thing to return the land to those whom it was stolen by the settler minority. The state have spent 44 billion on land restitutions alone, and yet they have nothing to show for it. The land is still in the hand of the settlers of racist minority, while African people are as salt like you have observed 100 years ago, not merely slaves, but perils in the land of their own births. We have witnessed the ANC brutally killing Andres Titani for demanding water and sanitation from the government that voted and was voted in by black people. We have witnessed the ANC killing 34 mine workers in Marikana in defense of white foreign capital 
when workers demanded a living wage. <clears throat> My apologies. We have witnessed the ANC systematically targeting the leaders of the Abashali Abambenjo Jondolo in KZN, <clears throat> assassinating them one by one. Thank you, you even know the name much better because it's of your party that are assassinating them. We have seen the ANC destroying all state-owned companies in order to hand these to the white handlers. We do not have electricity today, Honorable Hope, while you are howling here with your 24 votes today because the ANC looted ESCOM and did not make any logical investment needed to ensure that there's enough energy to meet the growing economy and social demand in this country. Today, the ANC continue to sell the country to the highest bidder through systematically destroying ESCOM in favor on the unreliable and scientifically unstable renewable energy sources. What pack between the ANC and the racist national party regime provided in 1994 was the continuation of colonial and apartheid forms of social and economic organizations merely under the political leadership of blacks. It is for this reason that today, the ANC stalwarts, prime defenders of colonialism, the DA as the worthy collision for them when they lose next year elections. The people of South Africa have a clear choice to make in 2024, either continue living under Thank the you, ANC managed apartheid government or choose a new path under the EFF, progressive EFF that will take over the union buildings. Aluta continua. The Honorable Sangwa is the next speaker. Order, order, honorable members. The order, confusion order, is honorable really members. high in this house, honorable chairperson. Because the very EFF that was here is voting with the very ANC in Ego Ruleni and COJ. Honorable House Chairperson, before South Africa gained her freedom, we saw not only oppression, but also censorship from the apartheid. Honorable members. Who tried to distort the picture the world saw of our country. Honorable Media members. Media was hard fought and hard won in South Africa. It would therefore be a travesty if government censorship like we saw yesterday, when an SABC crew was pulled from covering an IFP event on the instruction of the highest level, should once again become a norm. Any form of censorship is an attack on freedom of press, of expression, and even one could go as far as saying political rights of citizens as such restricts their access to information needed to make decisions on who to vote for. Honorable members, let us be honest with each other today. Our political freedom is an island in a sea of social economic injustice, where the previously disadvantaged are presently disadvantaged. South Africans are free, yet not free. Millions of our people live day by day lives character characterized by hardship much as they did before the dawn of democracy. If we were to discuss the democratic gains of our country, the, P the Constitution's Bill of Rights provides a veritable laundry list, equality, freedom, and security of the person, freedom of assembly, and the right to vote. For Black South Africans living under the apartheid regime, realizing these rights was, motiv was what motivated them to rise up and fight for freedom. However, the freedoms gained when South Africa became a constitutional democracy, as enshrined in our Constitution's Bill of Rights, are not worth the paper they are written on if the government of the day is not fulfilling its commitment to realize these rights for its citizens. Today, a new regime oppresses our people, and that is of extreme and crippling poverty. All these political freedoms are but an island in a sea of socioeconomic injustice. South Africa remains the most unequal society in the world, 
almost 30 million South Africans are dependent on grants, be it traditional grants or the 350 rands. This means that South Africa is a de facto welfare state with half of our population entirely dependent on state welfare. According to a study published in February 2023 by WITS, over 20.6 of South Africans were socially vulnerable and 20.4% were food insecure. That means that one in five people are at risk of hunger in South Africa. This is why programs such as the National School Nutrition Scheme, bungled by Wells Lunatal, as we've all seen feeding our children rotten food, which feeds almost 10 million children daily, cannot become pieces on a political chessboard. The IFP has acted decisively on this matter, and when the ruling party de deprived our children, millions of our children, of their right to access sufficient and healthy food in Wells Lunatal. Where there is poverty, and hunger, crime is never far behind. While the constitution may afford our people freedom and security of the person, they are not safe. According to the latest crime stats, 82 people are murdered each day and 135 rapes are committed each day. Crime is further exacerbated by the crippling unemployment, which currently stands at 32.7%. This means that one in three South Africans do not have work. Adding to the crime and unemployment equation are the never ending rolling blackouts. When the lights are out, criminals flourish and businesses are forced to close. The situation at ESCOM is yet another legacy of the currently failing ruling party. The entity has been hollowed out by years of corruption and lack of maintenance. Chairperson, in conclusion, it therefore seems presumptuous of us to be celebrating Freedom Day and Freedom Month and gathering here to discuss consolidating and safeguarding democratic gains when today millions of our fellow South Africans are thank agonized much. over well, whether or not they will have a meal tonight. I thank you. Yeah. Your Honorable Vessels. Thank you, Honorable House Chairperson. House Chairperson, the Honorable Hermans is correct. The ANC is a formidable force, a formidable force of destruction. They have destroyed everything they have touched. They destroyed our economy. They have destroyed our safety and security. They have destroyed our state-owned entities. They have ultimately destroyed our freedom. For how can we be free whilst we are imprisoned by poverty, fraud, corruption, poor health care, crime, and unemployment? Chairperson, the health of South Africa's constitutional democracy can be measured in terms of the level of political participation of South Africans. Now, when one goes and look at conventional political participation, which is voting in elections, which is participating in political party activities, which is participating in public participation of this parliament, then South Africa's democracy is in trouble. Let's just look at the voting eligible population of South Africa. We currently or we decline in 86% of the voter eligible population going to vote in 1994 to only 49% in 2019. The ANC government governs currently with only 28% of the voter eligible population, only 28%. We should do introspection because more than 70% of South Africans have no confidence in political parties, not only not in the governing party, but in all political parties. 70% of South Africans have no confidence in this parliament. Our democracy is in trouble. And then the Honorable Hermans should not say that we should protect the democratic gains we have made, we are destroying the de democratic gains we have made, and especially the ANC government. 
by fraud, corruption, and destroying the confidence of ordinary South Africans. We should restore confidence in this parliament. We should restore confidence in conventional political participation, which a lot of people fought very hard for. And that's being destroyed by destroying confidence in the institutions of this government. When people feel that they are not being represented in this parliament because of a complete circus and chaos, and I especially look to that side, then we are in trouble. We are in trouble when people feel that they have lost the satisfaction. Public opinion currently is, if you go and look at 2004, people were satisfied, 70% of South Africans were satisfied with basic services delivered by government. Currently, only 41% of South Africans are satisfied. That is a problem. It's delivered by government, Honorable Papu. It's not delivered, it doesn't fall out of the sky, but it isn't delivered by government. That's the problem, because people are living in dire circumstances. People are living without water supply. People are living with very poor sanitation. And that's the problem. The problem is that schools are not providing education. That's why we have unemployment. That's why we don't have, have a skilled workforce. Government should be replaced with a responsible government. Thank you very much, Honorable The Honorable Swartz. Honorable Swartz. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, Freedom Day commemorates the first past apartheid elections held on that day in 1994. And it was what many journalists, even secular journalists, referred to as the miracle of South Africa, which was followed by the inauguration of President Nelson Mandela, who modeled racial reconciliation, forgiveness, and nation building. South Africa became a beacon of hope for many nations. And our leaders assisted other nations in negotiating peace, such as the Good Friday, Northern Ireland Agreement in 1998. Parliament, sitting as the Constitutional Assembly, successfully negotiated a new constitution, encapsulating a constitutional democracy for the country. It is then correct that we pause and reflect on consolidating and safeguarding democratic gains in the country. And the ACDP does this from a deeply held faith perspective, grateful for the God-given peaceful transition to democracy that was achieved but mindful of the many challenges facing our nation. We do this out of the knowledge that South Africa is a deeply religious country, which in itself presents great hope for the future. Ebenezer, thus far has the Lord carried us. In this regard, we are reminded what US President John Adams said in 1798, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Morality and virtue must be the foundation of any country and are necessary for a society to be free. Sadly, from a place where South Africa held the high moral ground internationally, morality and virtue now seem lacking. This when one has regard to widespread criminality, including gender-based violence, looting and corruption of state resources, the proliferation of criminal syndicates operating in almost every sphere of society, ESCOM, Transnet, the construction sector, the mining sector, and sadly within law enforcement agencies themselves. In addition to this, we see a multitude of state officials who are enriching themselves at the expense of service delivery to the most vulnerable of society. The ACDP believes that what is needed is a recommitment to foundational values of honesty and integrity, of stewardship and servant leadership. What we need is self-control and self-governance. Let us as a nation recommit ourselves, as was done in the run-up to the 1994 elections, and pray and repent, as Daniel did, and work towards restoration of our nation. Sixty years ago, Martin Luther King delivered his memorable I Have a Dream speech. He said, let us not wallow in the valley of despair. So even though we face the difficulties of today or tomorrow, I have a dream. I have a dream that rough places will be made plain that the crooked places shall be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. With this faith, we will be able to hew out the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. And he ended by saying, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. I thank you.
Thank you very much, honorable member. UDM, ATM, the honorable Heron. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, South Africans have many good reasons to feel disappointed by developments over the past 29 years, but they don't detract from the fact that our liberation from apartheid was a very big deal, well worthy of celebration. When all South Africans were given the opportunity to vote for the first time in April 1994, it marked the end of the anti-apartheid struggle and the beginning of a new struggle for human rights and justice. It was a tipping point and not a finishing line. The freedoms we gained for which courageous compatriots laid life and limb on the line are not passive. They were expressed in the constitution and placed active obligations on the state to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice and fundamental human rights. Improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. Build a united and democratic South Africa. Chairperson, the extent to which we have fallen short of achieving these noble objectives is all around us. People rightfully ask what kind of freedom it is when we are immersed in crime and violence. What kind of freedom delivers an education system in which our children can't read for meaning and schools at which children die in pit toilets? What kind of freedom does not translate into dignified health care for all? What kind of freedom denies people access to sufficient water and food? What kind of freedom doesn't provide the level of social security necessary to cover the basic needs and dignity of all citizens? Passing budgets, giving the aged a paltry 2,000 rand per month pension with nothing for the young and the unemployed. What kind of freedom creates housing, social services, and planning systems that render more and more people homeless, stuck for decades in backyards, informal settlements, or on the streets? Where should people living on the streets go when they're evicted from the streets without being provided with transitional housing and social support? Chairperson, when we finish here tonight, switch off the lights and go home to a warm meal and a hot shower, families across the nation will be gathered in the dark around empty tables, not due to load shedding, but due to the exclusion of poverty. As freely elected representatives of South Africa gathered here, we must not sit comfortably. We've not earned the right to be comfortable with so much yet to be done. That is the challenge, Chairperson, that confronts us to reach across party political considerations and live up to the expectations of our people for a fairer and more inclusive society. It is a challenge that if we're honest reflects our failures, regardless of the color of our t-shirts to represent our people well. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable member. The honorable Kava. Honorable Chairperson, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this year marks 30 years since the passing of a leader of our nation and longest serving president, uh, Oliver Reginald Tambo, who committed his life to the struggle for freedom of a non-racial, non-sexist, free, just, and democratic South Africa, which belongs to all who live in it. We must not desecrate his contribution with hyperboles, hyperboles that have visited this debate. I can only summarize the debate of the DA and the Freedom Front Plus as follows. Open quote, I hear nothing, I see nothing, I know nothing, close quote. Whenever we debate and celebrate Freedom Day, we need to always ask ourselves fundamental questions as, as a people, and so should a parliament. Our struggle for liberation from the oppressive system of colonialism and apartheid was premised on the creation of an, of an equitable, equitable and just society. Colonialism and apartheid were reinforced by social institutions which seek uh, which sought to legitimize an unjust system through unjust laws. 
1994 breakthrough to constitutional democracy provides and protects the freedoms of all South Africans, black and white. It gave birth to a system based on a rule of law and a constitution which is premised on social justice through recognizing the injustices of the past. Our constitutional democracy laid the foundation to end the domination of one race over another. Freedom Day should remind all, of, all, all South Africans in our diversity of the commitment of all of us to build a nation, to build a nation which was interceded through a reconciliatory process for an epoch of social, economic, and political freedoms for all. As a nation, we should reflect on the road traversed in building institutions of democracy, which promotes and protects our rights. Through transformation of our laws, our judicial system has lived to its constitutional imperative of justice and equality before the law. Our jurisprudence has brought about transformative interventions to improve the quality of life of all citizens. Our jurisprudence does not only protect South Africans, but it, all, it protects the human rights of all humanity. Freedom is all about the realization of a democratic government by the will of the people. Democracy is not an, an end in itself, but a means in the creation of a better life uh, for, for all. The ANC has led the development of a legislative framework which empowers the people to be active participants in decision-making processes of their, own, of their own governance. This is a right enshrined in the constitution and embedded in our governance system to restore power to the people. Participation of the people in governance is a critical tenant which underpins our democratic systems. The economic and social political transformation of our society is not only dependent on the state as an institution, but on the actions of the people as a whole, working together through the state as an instrument for the creation of a just and equitable society. As a people, we need to also recognize and uphold the principle of freedoms and responsibility we all have the freedoms of the freedom of expression, but in the exercise of that freedom, we do not have to infringe on the freedom of others. Freedom of speech is not the freedom to discriminate against others. It is not a freedom to be a racist. It is not a freedom to be a sexist. It is not a freedom to be xenophobic. It is not a freedom to abuse others. We must exercise our freedoms within the spirit and intention of our constitution of healing the divisions of the past to establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. Our democratic government has realized many gains and the expansion of various social services in rural areas, in townships, and urban areas. Our right to protest should be exercised with responsibility without the destruction of infrastructure, which disrupt social services, leading to losses of billions of rands, which should be used to expedite development. As, a community, as communities, we should take ownership of our public goods and defend these democratic gains as they serve to improve the quality of our lives. We therefore need to be able to discern and rid ourselves of the vestiges of oppression and those who today seek to propagate ideas which undermine African unity, African unity and our freedoms. We should discern who propagates against um, the transform transformative policies of black empowerment and affirmative action to address the injustices of the past. We should discern those who advance their narrow interest in the name of the people, yet they retain a system of their economic dominance. The ANC and the people of South Africa have indeed traversed the 20 years, 29, 29 years of freedom. As a nation, we have been confronted by numerous challenges from the transition to a democratic dispensation, which was largely characterized by violence, yet we found a peace. 
We have been confronted by diseases such as HIV and AIDS, which have been sub, which have subdued, uh, and we have been confronted with economic crises, which have cushioned the nation and its uh, uh, economy. We have been confronted with a, a, a deadly coronavirus pandemic, and we did conquer the virus. We are today confronted with an electricity crisis, and we shall conquer, and we, we shall, with time, resolve the problem. The challenges that we confront, that confront our nation, are insurmountable. They require our collective efforts. Through our progressive and transformative legislation and policies, we need to ensure that we address the high levels of unemployment and equality to free the potential of all South Africans. Thank you very much, Chairperson. The Honorable Sheikh Imam. Thank you, House Chairperson. Yes, I think we must agree we live in one of the most unequal societies. We must agree poverty has risen. We must agree that lots and lots of people are homeless today. We must agree that lots of people don't have water. But the question is where? Is this happening only in ANC-run municipalities? What if I tell you, what if I tell you that some of the police stations in KwaZulu Natal, in Nongoma and things had to be closed down because there's no water? What if I tell you there are so many of these wards got no houses for people, they're still living in shacks? There is no water, people have to walk miles and miles just to get water. So what is the difference? These are some of the challenges that we tend to have. Go to KwaZulu Natal into some of the roads and look at the condition of those roads. You can't use an ordinary motor vehicle into those roads. So what freedom are our people in KwaZulu Natal particularly enjoying 29 years later? And that is why I have said before, maybe the DA and the ANC should work together. That was not a selfish statement, it was a selfless statement. Because we believe, because we believe that together you might be able to achieve more. That's why we said that. But instead of rather attacking and insulting each other, find solutions to the problem. Everybody is complaining about the conditions under which our people live, but nobody is giving solutions how we can work together and sort the problem out. Nobody wants that. And that is why I say, okay, that if this ANC does not attend, parliament will be dead because you've got nothing else to talk about. That's the problem we are sitting with currently. Now, there's no doubt about it. Let me tell you, wherever people are governing, there is challenges. There is no doubt about it. I can take you. Maybe the problem is some of you don't go to these areas and you don't see exactly in your own areas what is happening. Because if you take note of what is happening and how your people are suffering in their own areas, you won't come and attack other people, but you'll go and help them to make a difference in their lives. And what I'm telling you is facts, it's no fiction. It's what is happening as far as corruption is rife. The non-delivery of services, you know why? Do you know why KZN has only water tankers and no water delivery? Because through water tankers, you can steal. Through the water delivery, you can't steal. That is why you have so much of water tankers in KZN. Maybe Minister of Corporate must be able to tell us how much of water tankers are used in KwaZulu Natal. You'll be shocked. So I think what is important to note, yes, we have made some strides. A lot of work needs to be done. But let me tell you where it comes. It comes from ensuring that you have ethical leadership that wants to make a difference in the lives of the people. Not political parties who come Thank here to stand, but Madame. they are just as corrupt as everybody else. So Thank you. Thank you. The Honorable Ngoba. Thank you, House Chairperson. A few days ago, South Africans celebrated Freedom Day and commemorated the first post apartheid elections which were held on the 27th of April, 1994. 
This historic day came as a great beacon light of hope for millions of South Africans who wanted to see South Africa move forward. It came as a joyous day break to end the long nights of racial tensions and injustices. But sadly, the political freedom achieved in 1994 did not bring economic freedom. 29 years later, millions of South Africans are still suffering. 29 years later, millions of South Africans are still locked out of opportunity. 29 years later, millions of South Africans are unemployed. 29 years later, we still have learners in our schools falling into pit toilets because of the failures of an uncaring ANC government. 29 years later, South Africans do not feel safe because crime is rife. That is why we need a new government next year. A government that will give us economic freedom, a government that will give us job creation at scale, and a government that will protect us. House Chairperson, in 2024, South Africans have an opportunity to bring the government we need. And it is time for young South Africans like myself to rise up and say, enough is enough. To quote to the DA Youth Federal leader, Nicolas Nyati, young South Africans must no longer fold arms and watch a match we are supposed to be playing. 2024 is young people's 1994, and they must register in their numbers to vote. You know, in 1994, our parents and grandparents voted for freedom. And in 2024, young people will have an opportunity to vote for survival and real freedom. The time for voter apathy is over. Young South Africans must take ownership of their own future. As Barack Obama reminded us, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we have been waiting for and we are the change that we seek. As young people, we must make our own contribution in turning 2024 into another seminal moment in South Africa's history by replacing the ANC with a DA-led moonshot pact government. The DA is the only party in South Africa with a proven track record of clean, good governance. The DA-led Western Cape and the city of Cape Town are doing everything in their power to give people economic freedom. They do this by making it easy for businesses to operate and create jobs, and by making massive investments to end load shedding and to ensure a sustainable water supply. That is why in the last quarter of oh, no, 2022, oh, no, oh, no, the Western Cape was able to create 98% of the new jobs, while the, AN, the eight ANC-run provinces together contributed just 2%. House Chairperson, I would like to end off by quoting a paragraph from the preamble to our constitution to remind the ANC of what the government should be doing. And a few members have quoted this paragraph as well. And I quote, heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social Honorable justice, members, and please. fundamental human rights. Honorable Lay the foundations for a democratic and peaceful South Africa in which government is based on the will of the people and every citizen is equally protected by law. Improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. Close quote. This is what government should be doing. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Nova. Honorable Chafta. Thank you, Honorable Chair. 20 years ago. Honorable, honorable members. 20 years ago, we summoned courage. May I continue, Honorable, honorable members? Gashenibo. Honorable May I member, continue? I rising on a point of order. Uh, a point of order, Chair, because I can't, that member was about to come in now. My, my eyes, they, they're very hurtful. I, I, I think he was just cleaning his screen. Like, I can't see. I really can't see. He was really just cleaning. It was, you will see him just now. Texas. Honorable members, thank you very much. Honorable uh, Chafta, can you continue? It, uh, thank you, Chair. It's the fruit of our freedom. Uh, our freedom, see. Honorable Chair. We can't see. We, we can't are see what he's saying. load set uh, Honorable Chair. Honorable, that honorable is the fruit Chafta. of our freedom. Hello. Honorable Chafta. Honorable Chair. Uh, honorable Chafta. Hello, sir. Okay, okay, fine. 
you, you, you better switch off your. You better switch that is the proof of our gadget, freedom. Eh? Uh, we are allowed to Honorable here. members, please order. Honorable sir, the members ago, on the platform, can we give Honorable Jafta a chance? May he I has continue? Off Honorable. his video for you to listen. Please do. Honorable Jafta. 20 years ago, Honorable Sir, we summoned courage and marked a complete departure from the past. With the right, with the right to vote, many South Africans hoped for a better life. Bread and butter issues were foremost in their liberation. Our people are entitled to decent wages. They are entitled to access primary health care facilities at no fee to have access to clean water, electricity, and shelter. Our people are entitled to live in safer communities to be provided quality municipality services. Honorable Chair, while we have made tremendous gains, we have fallen behind in some areas. We know that 50% of young people are unemployed. 18 million South Africans rely on social grants, which means 42% of households depend on social grants. The Gini coefficient is still wide. The rate of unemployment sits at 32%. The income per capita is the lowest in the SATEC region. Violent crime have not abated. The global initiative against transitional organized crime is instructive in this regard. Young children are still subjected to pit latrines and feeding schemes in case that N schools are a complete shame. In the words of former Deputy Chief Justice Dihang Musineke, the revolution has failed. The state of our healthcare is in peril. There is also a creeping culture of construction mafias, which has devastating negative spin offs on investment. investment in infrastructure development. Our spending in education, health, policing, and policing is crowded out by corruption, maladministration, and abuse of state resources. Honorable Chair, as we said previously, it is not yet Uhuru. The shackles that bind our people must be lifted, and our people must use their democratic right to weed out poor service delivery. We have no cause to celebrate this year's Freedom Day. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The Honorable Malanisa. I think. Okay, uh, thank you, Chairperson, Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Chief Whip, Honorable Members of Parliament, fellow South Africans, the 27th of April in South Africa is a significant and symbolic day that as South Africans, we are all be taken back to reflect on where we come from as a nation. And we know that we are defined as a rainbow nation. It is a day where both black and white South Africans were freed from an oppressive system of the apartheid regime. A painful journey that many cannot easily forget from a childhood memories. This year, our theme is about consolidating and safeguarding the gains of democracy, meaning we're taking stock, taking measures on what is working or what needs to be fixed. That impedes to the, what we stand for in terms of socioeconomic issues in advancing the development and the economy. Honorable Chair, as an MP today, I choose not to complain I want to indicate to all members of parliament as, as well, fellow South Africans, to say that you need to check on the ANC statement that was released on the Freedom Day, that the ANC is taking note, indeed, we have some backlog in some issues of service delivery. Be it say, basic service delivery, access to health education, safety, social security, and economic opportunities. Hence, we have to do, hence we are saying that we are consolidating our democratic gains and unite the organization to ensure that with the people, we safeguard the gains of democracy. Honorable members, 
In consolidating our democratic gains, the ANC has ensured that the state provides developmental support and a safety net to protect the well-being of all South Africans. We have expanded access to early childhood development and made sure that we transform the educational sector with free access to primary to secondary schooling for the development of children till their teenage age. From the moment a child is conceived, our healthcare system provides support for mothers from prenatal care and the health support provided for childhood to old age. We are beginning to see the fruits of our prioritization of education with schools in the rural and township locations. Some of you, I know these rurals, you only know them when you do door to door, but some of us, we know what is happening at Brantle in Itutin. Our democratic government through the comprehensive social security system provides a safety net through the provision of grants to support the poor from childhood to old age. Some of you, you see this grant as a machinery to the election, but to others it's for survival. We have recently expanded the safety net through the 350 social relief grant for those between the age of 18 and 65. We are assessing the feasibility on basic income grant to ensure that no South African is denied the basic needs to protect their dignity and livelihood, as stipulated on section 27 of the constitution. We have seen the use of technology in the rapid response for illnesses like TB, STIs, HIV and AIDS and other diseases. People living with disabilities through their lobbying and advocacy now have technological devices offered by both government and the private sector. Referred to as mobile devices, we have ensured that the empowerment of people with disability is promoted to enable everyone to enjoy their freedom. Uh, I thought other members were going to allude in terms of what we have done today in ensuring that we free those who are deaf. But I, Singamako, we couldn't even acknowledge that. We have advanced equity. Our freedom has begun the journey of breaking the cycle of poverty. Indeed, not all is perfect. However, as a country, access to institution of higher learning is part of our priority agenda. And we have today have free higher education for the poor and the low middle strata. Koboya Tuto in our township is now the order of the day. Those who come from the township, they can attest that at least in each and every household, we have graduates today. With the, where there is corruption, there should be consequence management as this undermines our democratic gains. What we're saying, Honorable Chair, in my constituency, when I drop an advert regarding my development, the, regarding the development or empowerment opportunity, they always question us on the focus on those below the age of 35. They say this age retirement is a restriction for the unemployed above the age of 35. So as we are here as members of parliament, as legislatures, let us make sure we cover those who are above 35 because they are saying that we are actually excluding them from op economic opportunities. As we consolidate, decisive action should be our drive in saving and servicing our people because they deserve better. I want to address who belong to the liberation movement that what defines you from others is that you are thought to liberate yourselves. There is a song by one of the jazz legend, Jonas Wangwa, I know some of you, you don't know, uh, on his album called Flowers of the Nation, he says that freedom for some is freedom for none. So as the ANC, we do believe order, freedom honorable for members. some is freedom for none. Honorable members, as we are celebrating and commemorating the Freedom Day, my Africa Ibuwe, Africa Ibuwe, South Africa must rise and unite. Let's work locally and grow globally. Economic freedom in our lifetime, not for the few, but for all. Aluta continua, maibuye i Africa. Chairperson, I, I, I want to address Honorable Khao Khao. Honorable Khao Khao has made an, an opportunity to tell the young people to say that he is here today because of this liberation movement. 
And I want to say to Honorable Ngobo, shame on you, you're speaking on 2024. People are asking, what is it that we are doing as parliament today to make sure that we free them? Well, now you're speaking about 2024, but we are speaking about them now. Uh, Honorable Tenguini <laughs> and uh, Honorable Member from the IFP, I thought that you were going to acknowledge before that indeed we have made strides like Honorable uh, Sheikh has said to say we have moved from this far we are here and one, two, three needs to be done. However, you didn't give us anything to say that as members of parliament, let us work together, hold each other by hand and ensure that we service our people and we just do their just. Maibuye in Africa, it's now not 2024. It's 365 days, not 2024. It's every day, 24 seven. Thank you, honorable member. Uh, honorable Nansa. Order, order, honorable members. And uh, hon honorable members, just before Babu Nansa. Honorable Nansa. Honorable Nansa. Ganganin Jetat. Ganganin Jetat. Honorable Nansa. Ganganin Jetat. Honorable members, I, I would like to make a request that. Uh, we, we have a restaurant behind this chamber. Uh, that is where we get snacks and, and, uh, and uh, dishes. So I'll request members not to bring dishes into the house and snacks. Thank you very much. Uh, you can go ahead, Bab Nyonso. Honorable Chair. 27 April was a day on which the majority of the oppressed and disenfranchised African people exercised the right to vote. The excitement of long queues with first time voters patiently spending the day casting their votes was remarkable and to some unforgettable. This voting process was done with international hype with high expectations by the African people that things will change for real. But, but the foundation on which the election day was made did not have guarantees to restore the human dignity of the oppressed and exploited, nor did it have the transfer of land back to the indigenous people as its agenda. It only had a safety net for political athletes and tame pseudo revolutionaries. That is the only thing to talk about when 27 April is remembered, not the Freedom Day. Definitely not the, not the national liberation. It is misleading to refer to the day as Freedom Day. Yes, perhaps Freedom Day for the apartheid rulers to wash off the, the greatest crime to humanity that they have committed. Maybe freedom for colonial masters to keep the land and its resources that they stole without any consequences happening or the so-called freedom to legitimize settler colonialism and the continuous exploitation of the Azanian masses. For us in the PAC, it was and continues to be the fake freedom. On that day in 1994, genocide was happening in Rwanda. Flag independence was proven to be the dummy soul to African people. Divide and rule tactics used by imperialists were being put into effect, were excited and failed to learn from the settlement of fake independence in Africa made in the early 1960s. Do it yourself arrangements made at Cordesa to put African people under the sphere of influence of the former colon colonies cannot be celebrated as freedom. For the PAC, the right to call our souls our own is the true meaning of freedom. We are our own liberators. The African people are free only when they have the power to decide what their God-given right is over their land. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The Honorable Hendricks. Honorable House Chair, thank you very much. Honorable House Chair, I remember that when I put my ballot form into the ballot box, since that moment, it has been a thrill a minute 
as we advance in uh, expressing our freedom. So yes, many of the milestones have not been rich, but we have to say that things have only got better. But it is not up to those in the liberation movement to advance freedom. It is the responsibility of any, every honorable member in this house and every political party in this house to advance freedom. There has been a call, honorable house chair, and you'll be shocked to hear this. There has been a call to unfreedom, freedom day. I don't, Al Jamaat doesn't agree with that. We feel that there's enough excitement in this house to advance freedom. And that is what we are, are looking for. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chair. Thank you, Honorable Hendricks. The Honorable Maglova, the next speaker. Voorzitter, lijkt voor mij die regerende partij het vergeet ik kom van Matlosana. Alabama, een club gooi van waar die verwikkelingen plaatsgevind het. En toen hulle hoor die president kom, toe word die straten geteer, potholes word toegemaak, die gras word gesnee, die mens het hot flashes gekry voor iemand wat honderde en miljoene dollars onder een matras he. Ek wil vir achtbare hermane sê, sy praat van policies, en huise wat hulle bou, ek wil vir jou sê, waarom trek die mense weskap toe, want die mense kom waar daar een geleentheid is. In his speech, the president mentioned Matlosana seven times, including Makwete, where the late Desmond Tutu resided. Let the record reflect the true state of the freedom thinking about the people of Matlosana, where I come from. The municipality of Matlosana's bank account has been a touch of 1.24 billion rand. We spent up to 10 hours on load shedding. On this will be stage eight. The municipality of Matlosana suffered for weeks without water. The running of sewage is, has become a norm in Matlosana. Infrastructure in Matlosana is falling apart with no investment opportunities. I will for Honorable Klaba say, I say, when er die dia apraat, uh, uh, dan worry nie, dan sien hy nie, is doof. Yes, the ANC is hearing deaf. That's why predictions have it that you are under 40%. The late Desmond Tutu, and I also want to quote, and I also want to quote an icon. The late Desmond Tutu once said, and I quote, let the ANC know that they have a large majority. Well, Mubarak had a large majority, and also Gaddafi had a large majority. Watch up, I'm warning you, watch out. The indicators is there. Wake up and smell the moonshot elections of the Democratic Alliance. Matlosana hospitals, hospitals falls apart. Doctors and patients have been robbed in broad daylight by brazen criminals whose rights and freedoms means nothing in Matlosana. Honorable Mananiso, you say we talk about the future, we must talk about none or now. We at least have the ability to think about the plan because we do have a vision. The patience of Matlosana is vulnerable and cannot protect themselves against criminals in aid for public health care. Nothing will replace the 21,000 murdered victims and also the 40,000 rape victims a year in our country. No one will uh, forget the victims of Lily Mines whose bodies remain uh, uh, and who will forget Marikana massacre. As part of the commitment to our freedom internationally and an in, and, and, and internationally criminal court was established. But as we commemorate this Freedom Day, our government is grappling with the political dilemma of choosing between welcoming an ideological compatriot or arresting the same person perpetrating a brutal crimes against a woman and children. We should reflect and bow our heads in shame. Instead, this government established inter-ministerial committees, one after the other, at the expense of the public, with findings that have been made that is horrendous. We have our own Putins wandering around in the streets of South Africa, and some of them are sitting here in Parliament for who justice will never come. Kissing 
and licking the pink red wine. Their freedom is the end of our freedom. I thank you. Thank you, honorable member. The honorable the minister of sports, arts and culture. Welcome, Honourable Minister. House Ministers and Deputy Ministers, leaders of political parties present, Honourable Members. This year marks our, our 29th annual celebration of Freedom Day. It is also the year we commemorate the 27th anniversary of our Constitution as the Supreme Law of the Republic. Our rights are protected under the constitutional democracy which promotes inclusivity, equality, non-racialism, non-sexism, national unity, social cohesion, justice, and diversity. In our celebration of the Freedom Month, we are reminded that our freedom was not free. Our roads to democracy required untold sacrifices with innocent lives martyred in pursuit of our freedom. Among those that come to mind, Chairperson, as Solomon Kalushi Matlangu, Griffiths and Nonya Mezelum Kwenge, the Krejok Four, the Kosas Four, Krisani, and many martyrs of our struggle. We will always be indebted to those who walked before us. Chairperson and honorable members, there will always be a reason to celebrate our freedom as South Africans. For those who lived under apartheid, the defeat of an evil system called apartheid on its own is a reason to celebrate. Madam Speaker, in reality and in truth, the nation called South Africa as defined in the preamble of our constitution did not exist before 1994. To some members, very few in this house, there exists a minority attempting to convince the nation that there is no relationship between redress and nation building. There is a denial that redress is a necessary condition for nation building and reconciliation. It was befitting, therefore, that nation building and social cohesion became a preeminent preoccupation of the African National Congress led government, with a growing number of socioeconomic battles won and many challenges still confronting us. Our position remains that of resilience and zealous effort to overcome our adversities. The African National Congress continues to hold the conviction that as South Africans, we have a reason to celebrate the freedom the freedoms we fought for despite facing numerous challenges. The crippled challenge of unemployment, poverty, unemployment, and inequality, coupled with lack of service delivery, lack of service delivery, however, still remains. It is suggested by some pundits that this may be the contributing factor to some of the social ills that continue to stammer our progress. These are challenges that we face, and these are the challenges that plagued, that plagued by and we are consistently finding long-term long solutions and sustainable solutions to it while implementing short-term measures so as to ensure that the country remains active and productive. At the heart of service delivery is the capacity of local government to deliver. Our deepest concern, Chairperson, is the current chaos as dysfunctionality of local government coalition nationwide. The related levels of instability have undermined service delivery in a number of municipalities, as well as effective administrative management, resulting in reversal of gains and investments that the government has put into these municipalities. We have overcome obstacles and achieved many of the promises we made. We are quite aware that there's still a room for improvement. We'll never tire until our people all achieve economical emancipation. Mte umkama isesi wambile, indi maikaita yoko mvawe poke. The first argument that life was better under apartheid rule, the first argument that those who say life was better under apartheid rule, what they really mean is that life was easier for an oppressive minority. The infrastructure, the economy, and service delivery they used to justify their arguments were not meant to save the larger majority of South Africans. In fact, they depended on inequality, poverty, injustices, and cruelty to sustain themselves. The second argument to support this, to support the notion that life was better under apartheid, 
is based on racial stereotypes and philosophy of racial supremacy. Before 1994, majority of South Africans were excluded from decision-making, including deciding who should leave them, who should leave them. In truth, the previous, the previous regime surrendered because apartheid was unsustainable. They had looted and undermined their own system to a point of collapse. Amakum Kuka Kulumente of Panane Post Office, not Transnet, were a dumping ground for unskilled, uneducated, and unprofessional Afrikaner labor. There is no cleverness or virtue for lessons to be learned from those willing to oppress their fellow men. Not now, not ever. Abanya and Gokubenza in Holo, a Pazanya Seku Kamla, Kulen Kubo, Kamaslingane as an ANC. But This is confirmed by Mahatma Gandhi when he says. Freedom, freedom is not worth having it if order, not. Order, honorable members. I just, I just want to make that quote again. Honorable freedom members. is not worth having it if it has not included the freedom to make mistakes. Nakubeni kunjalo somlomo obegekleyo tina singa malungu ombuto esizwe tiasbopele la sizinike la nakanjalo. Honorable, honorable minister. There's a point of order for the please take a seat. Honorable. No, th 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 thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Honorable Chair, I, I, I really rise on a point of order that the speaker on the podium who can't hear the speaker. They, 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 there is, there is the members on that side overpowering the speaker. And I would want you to intervene and ask that Thank you very much. the members keep quiet and the speaker proceeds in a quiet environment. Thank you very much. Already, I'm, on, I'm still on the sure. platform chair, thank and you. they are still doing that. Okay, thank Can you. Can you please attend to that? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chanji. Honorable members. Honorable members. Honorable Makaola. Please let's allow the speaker to continue his speech. Allow the minister to continue. House Chair and Honorable Members, for us to overcome these challenges and deliver on the better life for all, we must work together as a nation. Our history of division, injustice, and suffering should inspire us to build a better and more united nation, a better future that we can live as a legacy of our generations to come. Just to respond to two members that I only require their response. Two members from a party called DA. Uh, Kau Kau or Ka Kau 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 and Honorable Nobo. Uh, uh, what's your point of honor, Honorable Minister? What's your point of honor, Honorable Ka Kau? House Chairperson, my surname is Ka Kau. Okay. Just to get that correction correct. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Honorable Kau Kau. Just, just to. Order, Honorable Members. Kau Kau. Order, Honorable Members. Honorable Members. I've always. I've always heard of a history of Unong House. Tonight, I've seen Unong House. I've seen the history of Unong House, Ongoma, Abantu, Bebe Kunezela, Abantu Bakuabo, including Honorable Ngobo, Ebe Tetenai on behalf of ETA. Now, Ibu Shungu Kasibona into ANZ Kakuni, Goba Lempat and Nikuyo Ayoyen in Abantu Bay. Very soon, Sotibana Nani Puma Alam Yango, Nani Puma Alam Yango Niato, Labanye Benu, Bebunjani, a Pagat. Very soon, very soon, you'll be kicked out of it. Nobody deliberately 
ETA is seven the same Nina, Okabala Lenu, Banam Sanje, Nikot, Nikate Okulmente, Okulele, Okulule Nina, Namazali, Abanizala. Over today, over today, I can assure you that in the Babonina, Abamele, Abakinese, and Pambi, Roba, they have been recruited from, they have been recruited by former explorer or uh, uh, oppressor to come and say there is no liberation, and yet they know. One of the liberation and celebration we must make today, the defeat of apartheid, is what we must, we must celebrate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the honorable members. I request members to stand and wait for the chair and the maze to leave the chamber. That concludes the business for the day and the house is adjourned.